From hot chocolate in London to ramen in Los Angeles, we found the best of the best foods in cities around the world. Hi guys, I'm Heron, the producer and a co-host for Best of the Best. On this season, Alana and I first started our journey finding the best chocolate chip cookie in New York City. This ended up being a pretty divisive episode. Our whole team was pretty much split. But ultimately, we had to decide a winner. I'm Heron. And I'm Alana. And today we are on our way to start our journey to find the best chocolate chip cookies in New York City. So there are so many places in New York City to get chocolate chip cookies. And we narrowed it down to four top spots based on internet research, word of mouth, and a little bit of personal experience. And I am starving, so let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> Alana and I luckily have similar tastes when we're talking about the ideal chocolate chip cookie. We're looking for a crunchy, crispy exterior and a gooey interior. And a bunch of chocolate chips spotted throughout the cookie. Our first stop is Jacques Therese Chocolate. Jacques Therese is a world famous pastry chef and chocolatier. Chef Therese specializes in handcrafted chocolates made with fresh, real ingredients. Hello, I am Jacques Therese from Jacques Therese Chocolates. And this is the home of the best cookies in New York. This is my go-to spot for chocolate chip cookies. Um, I come here at least once a month, and it's conveniently very close to my house and my office, so it's easy to stop by. It's very dangerous. Give to your customer what your customer wants. And Americans love cookies, so when you do the things right, your cookies will be a little bit crispy on the outside, soft on the center, with a nice layering of chocolates. Not too chewy, not too soft. So John now is responsible for pastries, the pastry chef. And John is going to show you how to make all those cookies. First, we're going to mix this together until it's nice and light and fluffy. Next, we're going to add the eggs, eggs and vanilla. So we use two kinds of flours. We use a bread and a pastry flour. Um, and that's part of what makes our cookies a little bit unique as well. And it uh, contributes to the texture and consistency of the cookie. This is a dark chocolate, 64%. We use two bags of this to make a, a, a batch of cookies. That's 30 kilos. We lift the 100 kilo cookie dough with a forklift. From there, we use a blowtorch to warm the bowl to loosen up the cookie mix so that it can be removed and added to the hopper. The cookie machine will cut 80 cookies a minute. From there, they're taken and placed on trays to be baked. After they're baked, they are cooled down and wrapped. Shall we? Yeah, let's do it. I like this very much. Okay. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> I love the chocolate to cookie ratio. Um, and I love the crispiness mm -hmm. and the chewiness. Mm -hmm. I love the additional sense of vanilla that I get in this cookie compared to a lot of the other chocolate chip cookies that I've had just in my life in general. <laughs> what about you? For me, I'm kind of on the same boat with you. I love the chocolate. Like, if you just look at this cookie, it's just one big big mama glob of chocolate. Mama glob. <laughs> big mama glob of chocolate right there in the center. Uh, but yeah, I really, really love this. If I could just want one more thing, sea I would- Sea salt. I would want sea salt, yes. Sea salt on top. Definitely sea salt on top. That would make this cookie like 10 times better. And maybe a little bit softer on the inside. Um, I love a crispy exterior, but I, I want something a little softer on the inside. Our second stop is Dominique Ansel Bakery. Chef Ansel is a revered pastry chef, famous for his creative takes on classic desserts. His take on the chocolate chip cookie is a little unconventional. So I created the cookie shot uh, a few years ago now when I was invited at South by Southwest uh, to create something for, for the show. I created the cookie shot and at the time uh, it was just for one day. 
and it got so popular that I had to bring it back to New York. It was a great cookie shot. Like the milk, it was cold milk, and then it was a warm cookie with chocolate inside. So I think it was a really nice mix. I've never had a chocolate chip cookie like this before. I think the cookie shot is uh, simply simple. <laughs> it's uh, something that is easy to understand. It's fun, and it's a great way to experience a uh, chocolate chip cookie. The cookie shot is one of our best sellers, and the best way to eat the cookie shot is actually to serve it warm, uh, add uh, the vanilla milk inside, uh, have a sip of the milk from the, out of the cookie, and then take a bite of the cookie. So first we use a silicone mold that is hollow in the center, and here we have our rectangle of dough. So we use banana chocolate chips in our cookies. We'll take this dough and we push it inside the mold all the way down, and then we close off the top. Once it comes out of the oven, we let them cool. Then we line them with our chocolate in the center to make sure that the, sip, the milk doesn't sip out. Uh, and then we pour the milk uh, infused with vanilla in the center of the cookie. So the cookie is hot and the milk is ice cold. So a fun, really fun way to enjoy it. Have you ever seen a chocolate chip cookie fashioned in this way? I've seen a lot of things in my 26 years of life can't say that this is one of the things I've seen. So, you know. How genius is this creation? I think it's pretty freaking genius. All right, shall we? Yep. Let's go. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh, it's soft. Ooh, yeah. Oh, mama. Wait. I feel like there's so many different ways that you could go to town on this thing, but he suggested taking that sip and then taking a bite of that cookie. And it's that perfect bite of like cookie to milk. When you take a bite of it after drinking the milk, you have that kind of mushy cookie thing that you get with- When milk. you dip it in milk right. for a while, yeah. And the cookie itself is just a solid, delicious cookie. It's not just like a fun way of presenting a chocolate chip cookie. This is a solid chocolate chip cookie. I loved that milk mm -hmm. that's like, mixed in with that Tahitian vanilla and that sugar, and I just wanted more of that. That is my yeah. only critique. Otherwise, chocolate chip cookie, every time you take a bite of this thing, ideal bite. Oh. Our third stop is Leven Bakery. It's well known for its massive cookies and has won countless awards from near and far. Leven Bakery is most known at this point for our cookies and most known for the chocolate chip walnut is our most popular cookie. I think it's a classic cookie that people love. This is my very first time at Levain. My daughter has been telling me non-stop that we have to get one of these cookies. Ever since I came to New York, I've been here so many times, just way too many times. You like it? Mm-hmm. Best cookies in the world. Mm-hmm. When the lines are long at the bakery, they move really quickly, which is great. A line is great as long as it's moving, and it's usually about 15 or 20 minutes. After we realized that they were a hit, then we started kind of playing with the recipe a little bit more. It took us about a year to get it exactly how we wanted it, but no really big changes. Yeah. We get two people to get the bowl because it's so big and heavy with all that dough and carry it over to the table. We weigh each cookie by hand to be sure that it's six ounces. Every location bakes everything freshly each day, and what we don't sell, we donate at night. Every cookie that you get when you come to Levin Bakery is probably gonna be less than an hour out of the oven. They have this cookie recipe to a science, and their whole objective is to have this crunchy, like crispy exterior and then the inside should be like molten, kind of still gooey on the inside. Okay, so excited, okay, woo! How is it, do you like it? I'm sure. This thing is chunk full of chocolate chips, okay? It's literally maybe like an inch in width. It is. You oh see that God. molten mm. interior? Mmm, what? That, that is the reason why this place is so popular. This cookie for me checks off all the boxes. The textures are right. The chocolate chips are just literally speckled throughout the cookie. Mm -hmm. And there's like a hint of nuts. I seriously just don't see yet how any cookie could compare to this. This is gonna be really hard to beat. Our last stop, Mama. This cafe slash bakery slash restaurant is home to the nutty chocolate chip cookie. The cookies are so popular that Mama makes around 3,000 cookies to last for just two days. 
So for those of you who don't know, Mama means mother in French, and we named it that as a tribute to our mothers who are our biggest influence in the kitchen. So my husband and I opened up Mama in October of 2014. We opened it up uh, kind of selfishly. We wanted to kind of create a space that embodied wonderful home cooking and a beautiful home-inspired environment. I live across the road, so this is kind of like my local coffee shop, um, and this, the cookies are amazing, especially the chocolate chip cookie. It's like a really like homemade cookie, like it's definitely like freshly made, but the chocolate in the cookie is just, you know, really, really good and just melts in your mouth. So our nutty chocolate chip cookie is one of our most classic dishes and the best dish that we're known for here at Mama. So we really wanted to mix that classic chocolate chip cookie with the buttery, salty, nutty essence that the French culture offers. So we've had quite a bit of notoriety on our nutty chocolate chip cookie and our claim to fame was back in 2017 for the holiday season, Oprah put it on one of her favorite things. One batch makes 3,000 cookies and that normally lasts for two days. So this salt is from a small city in the west of France and is coarser and more salty than the table salt. So that it's one of the ingredients who makes the cookie very special. Next, we combine together all of the nuts, making sure we're using full salted almonds, macadamia nuts, and walnuts. And next up, the chocolate. To make sure there's a gooey chocolate piece within each bite, we use 61% Qatar chocolate wafers. Okay, so I'm not like a chocolate chip expert here, but this already has gained 5,000 points. Do you know why? Oh, it's a positive. Okay. It's a positive. My points are positive because this cookie is mostly chocolate. This chocolate chip cookie definitely has more chocolate than the other ones we have tried. All right, let's uh, dig in. Uh, break, wait, first I'm breaking. Oh my God, what? Okay, like there's barely any room for the actual cookie up in here. Let's just appreciate first. It's like melting out. Okay. Yes. There's not one basic bite in this mm -hmm. cookie. I am big on desserts that aren't just straight sugar. Mm -hmm. I feel like a This definitely isn't too sweet. No, no, no. It's like the nuts and the salt balance it perfectly. Well, but it's not like a salty cookie, you know what I mean? No, not at all. I'm trying to find like any negative about this cookie and I really can't. I don't know, Lana. Like, this might be a really hard one to decide which one's the best. And now it's time to decide which cookie is the best of the best. So unfortunately, Alana, our journey to find the best chocolate chip cookie is finally over. So many good ones. I know, so many good ones. But it's time to pick the best chocolate chip cookie in New York City. Are you ready? Don't look. I'm not looking. Don't look. I already have an inkling of an idea of where you're gonna pick. One, two, three. I knew it. As much as I am disappointed in your <laughs> answer, I want to know what your reasoning is. Okay, so when I had the mama cookie, mm -hmm. first thing off the bat, the, t the chocolate. Every single bite, my mouth was just covered in chocolate. The nuts in the cookie just had this wonderful crunch, great textural component. So for the exact reasons that you just explain. I did not pick them all for that specific reason. Really? It was a delicious cookie, don't get me wrong, but I picked the vent because it checked off all the marks. It's crispy on the outside, it's molten and gooey on the inside. You're still getting globs of chocolate every time you bite into it. It's just, they're two iconic cookies in their own way. If we're talking about my favorite cookie, I'm gonna say my mom, but if we're gonna be objective, the price is just, you know, they're about the same and you get more cookie with Levin. The lines out the door is just another thing that I think like symbolizes New York City and that experience. Sure. So if you're talking about the best chocolate chip cookie in New York City, it is Levin. I hate being wrong, but I guess for this one time, I'll have to concede. Y'all, there are more episodes here. I just I'll want concede. a tally of how many times I am going to be right. Whatever. All right, I will say for this. The best of the best cookie is Le Bon. Le Bain? Le Bain? I don't know. I still don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> so there you have it. Le Bain, the winner. Listen, all four of these places were fantastic. 
Hi everyone, I'm Joe. I'm one of the co-hosts and co-producers of a few episodes of this last season of Best of the Best. I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about some fun things from behind the scenes. Best tacos in LA. Uh, this one was a lot of fun because we got taco expert Bill Esparza to help us out. He helped us whittle down the list. A few of these places I don't think you'd really find or they wouldn't be on a lot of like best of lists and anywhere else. Man, that's so good. We're here in Los Angeles for the best of the best tacos. Sid, if I had to guess, I'd say there was, I don't know, about a million taco places in Los Angeles. So we went through best of lists on Thrillist, Eater LA, Infatuation, Yelp, Com. Wow. And also we reached out to Bill Esparza, the Los Angeles taco expert. Bill Esparza is a James Beard award-winning writer who literally wrote the book on LA's Mexican food. With his help, we whittled the list down to four of the best tacos in this city. Tacos are important to Los Angeles because Los Angeles is a Mexican city. We're in a Latino city. Tacos are um, one of those foods that, that stand out. Sid, we got the best carne asada. We got the best carnitas, we got the best shrimp taco, and of course the best fish taco. So is it comparing all these different proteins and tacos kind of like comparing apples to oranges? Great point. We wanted to make sure that we well represented the variety and cultural depth of tacos that LA has to offer. Sounds delicious, let's get started. Our first stop is Sonora Town in downtown Los Angeles. They make the most amazing flour tortillas. I'm really excited to try them. They drive to Mexico at least twice a month to get special flour to make them. They also cook their carne asada over a mesquite grill, which is actually pretty unique for Los Angeles. We serve tacos estilo Sonora, which is to say from northern Mexico rather than central or south. Uh, it's a little different style. We do tortillas de harina made by hand, fresh every day, with flour that we bring from his hometown in Mexico, in San Luis Rio, Colorado. And we grill over a fire, a mesquite wood fire. We use charcoal, uh, and that adds the sort of like signature flavor to all of our food. Sonora Town is a game-changing restaurant because they really introduced northern style tacos. Carne asada, the verb asar means to roast, and you don't roast meat on a flat top. What Sonora Town did by investing and in putting a grill and a hood inside their restaurant made it possible for them to cook the way people do in the north. We've been here before. We're, my mom's actually from Sonora. So this is the only place that has tacos like back there, and they're amazing. The tortillas are the best. The tortillas, they're homemade. You can taste the difference from store-bought flour tortillas. We use short ribs instead of just sort of like a cheaper cut because Sonora reps really hard with their carne asada, and we have to do it right. It's a very expensive choice to make, but it's worth it when you taste the flavor. When you cook over fire too, you end up with crispy fat instead of sort of like gummy or chewy fat, which is beautiful in a taco. We're slicing the short rib up and putting the steaks onto the grill. And we're waiting to see a little bit of uh, bubbling in the fat. I and mean, we're cooking it all the way through because it is a true carne asada. And then we're dicing it up very fine so that every bite that you have has a little bit of fat and a little bit of meat, a little chew to it. We're dressing it with a spicy chile de arbol salsa and an avocado puree and cabbage and then we dress it with grilled green cebollitas on the side and rabanos. Twice per month, I travel five hours to Sonora to cross the border and bring over as many sacks of flour as I can. Sonoran wheat is known to be a little softer and it makes a more delicate, airy tortilla. You can smell that meat cooking down the street. Walking up here, I was like, I think I'm close. Uh, the tacos are flying off of that grill. Wine's still out the door. I mean, you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So great. They got the loudest chairs possible, which I think was a smart move. Is this us? Oh, just in time. This is the first time, Sid, that I've been served uh, tacos with a side of charred scallion. Really? Yes, really. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of one of my favorite parts about getting tacos, like good tacos, that they should come with a side of charred scallion. 
That's oh, like okay. a big part of it for me. No onions, no tomatoes. No onions, no tomatoes. No cilantro. I, I would never put a tomato on my taco, ever, ever, ever. But we need lime, obviously. We need lots and lots of lime. We got the radish, which I also love. No thanks. Really? I don't like radishes. This guy is so from Chicago, it's like not a joke. These also don't have cheese on them, I want to point out. Which, uh, Who wants cheese on a taco? See what I'm dealing with over here? <laughs> it's the carne asada and the tortilla. I don't want anything to get in the way of that. Okay. All right, let's say goodbye. All right, do it. Mm. That's so good. It's mm. really good. The char on that meat is so wow. flavorful. And you can taste the difference in those tortillas. I don't think I've ever had a tortilla like that. Yeah, if you don't like flour tortillas, it's because you haven't had a good flour tortilla. These are absolutely amazing. Um, they're soft, they're a little doughy and almost like cake-like, uh, and it melts together with the meat, and the salsa adds like that much-needed acid from the richness of the meat and the tortilla. It's really, really good. I can see why they've won the LA Taco Best Taco in LA Award two times. Not once, twice. Now let's head over to Boyle Heights to check out Marisco's Jalisco. Marisco's, it translates as in Spanish as seafood. And our name actually is Jalisco, uh, my, my state in Mexico, where I am from. We do nothing but seafood. The most popular is the Taco de Cameron, a deep fried shrimp taco. It was recently featured in David Chang's Ugly Delicious, and Chrissy Teigen had them come to her house. What I can let you guys see is when we just deep fry the taco, not the process of making it before that. That's what I can show you guys. Top secret, sorry. He starts with a pre-stuffed taco ready for the deep fryer. What's in them? Look, I asked him five times, but he wouldn't say. All I know is they're shrimp. You can try asking him yourself, but my guy was pretty tight-lipped. Once they come out of the fryer, they get topped with avocado and their house-made salsa. Salsa. Whatever, you know what I mean. A side of lime, and they're ready to eat. I tell everybody to be careful when you try this taco, because they're very addictive. I've been coming here in 20 years. I'm ready for some tacos. Ah! They're a bit heavy. I mean, they pack yeah. whatever's in here, they packed it in here. So, yeah. I'm excited. It? Let's take a bite. All right. Dude. Right? Were you oh, expecting my... that? No. When you expect when you hear seafood taco, you're just going to be like, yeah, I, I had an idea what that's mm -hmm. like. I've never tasted a seafood taco like this. Sweet Lord, it's so good. And throw the top in I think they fry what's inside the taco, and then they fry it again. Because you see like the breading like on the top? That's my guess. It's really good. It's almost like if you made like a fish and chips taco. Whatever he's doing with the seafood and mixing it in there and frying it, how he, he is presenting it is, is unlike any other taco that I've had, certainly any other seafood taco that I've had. I think this is the perfect thing to give to somebody that says they don't like seafood because if you eat this, mm -hmm. you're gonna be a seafood person. He was telling us that people come from San Diego, they come from San Francisco, they drive several hours just to come right here, and I can say, absolutely worth it. I'm dying for some carnitas, and I know just the spot, Carnitas El Momo. We specialize in anything pork, whether it's ear, pig feet, snout, whatever you guys want pork, we could cook it however you want it. We're trying to become a staple as other carnita spots have been here, but we feel we're just way much above than they are. We just feel our taste is better. We feel we've just outgrown them and just been more advanced with our technical cooking, which is old school, eight hours all the way through, no rush and no heat lamps. Carnitas are made by slow cooking pork in oil or lard for several hours until it's nice and tender. It's usually pork shoulder or butt because those are the fattiest cuts and make for the most tender and juicy carnitas. We don't put our carnitas under heat lamps so it never gets dried out. It's always juicy. Um, we serve three different types of cuts which is buche, pork belly, pork skin which is cuerito, and then we pour pork shoulder which is maciza. Romulo has been doing carnitas for more than half a century. He's a master. I can go right to Boyle Heights 
you get the same quality carnitas that I'll have in Mexico and really with his wonderful regional touch of, of Guanajuato where they just take the carnitas and they put pickled um, chiles on top maybe just a little salsa and it's just beautiful when that pickling juice blends in with the fat and the sweetness of the carnitas it's like it's perfect we live pretty close by first is the man Looking at this carnitas, I don't think I've ever seen a carnitas like this. What do you think? This is piled high. Like, I've never seen a taco with so much filling in it before. They have so many different varieties of carnitas that they have here. This is, I think, like the, a blend of everything, they say. Yeah. Uh, I think I heard the shoulder, mix. the mix. They yeah. got ear, shoulder, probably some butt, skin, all the good stuff. Oh my God, they weigh like it's the size of a newborn baby. <laughs> all right. Oh man, that's so good. Oh my goodness. Mm. Thank you. It melts in your mouth. Thank you for doing this. Wow. The onion and the cilantro with this pork, perfect. If anything else was on it, it'd be taking away too much of it. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. just, this is incredible. You can taste this crispiness in the texture, the burnt little crispy ends with the fat that's in here just coming together. It's like, mm, it's just delicious. The fat melts in your mouth and I added some of their salsa, which is really bright and acidic that I love on my tacos. And the tortilla stays together, which is super important when you're putting this much meat inside of the tortilla. There's a lot of fat in these tacos um, because they dip the tortillas in what I assume is some kind of fat. Yeah. It's excellent. Dip everything in fat always. For our final stop, we're getting an authentic taste of Ensenada at Ricky's Fish Tacos. I've been here more times than I can count. I'm from London. I come here every time I'm in LA. This one best for a taco. It all started with uh, the need of an Ensenada fish taco with a uh, authentic recipe. And I thought I could do it. So I asked for grandma's and mom's recipe and put it together. I brought the recipe from Ensenada, authentic. I started doing it with um, Mexican oregano, uh, the flour, all the ingredients imported uh, from Mexico. It's very simple. It's just a five uh, ingredient recipe for the batter and water to it. We use just lots of uh, uh, good old American mustard, oregano, salt, baking powder, and, and wheat flour. We get uh, the 22 pound box of uh, swai filet. It's a type of catfish that is very lean. We just have to add a bunch of uh, garlic powder and salt and brine it overnight. Uh, strain it, pack it, and have it ready for, uh, to throw it into the batter and uh, deep fry it on lard. Now we've already had technically a fish taco already for this, yeah. but these are completely different. Well, the Mariscos Jalisco was shrimp. Yeah, but that's also a fish, right? No, absolutely not. It's seafood. Shrimp is fish. Can we like do a check on that? Is shrimp fish? Looks like it's gonna be my favorite. I'm not the biggest fan of corn, and like, it feels a little dry. Okay, fair enough. But we were in there and we watched them make this batter and fry these fish, uh -huh. and it just looks incredible. When that fish came out and he dumped it, I was like, I want that so bad, so. It feels like there's a lot of fish in here. Yeah, 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 he did not skimp on the fish, which I like. Most fish tacos, they are kind of light on the fish. Yeah, and I got all the toppings. No lime here, funny enough, right. uh, and it, it smells spicy. Let's bite. Let's do it. Wow. This is incredible, man. Mm. It is like, can you see like how much fish is in this taco? It's a lot. Yeah. 
You know when you get like fish and chips, like battered fish? Yeah. That's what this is like. You yeah. get a big piece of fish. He, he would take them out of the fryer occasionally to stab them to like get the heat in there faster. Okay. Yeah, because the pieces are so big. Yeah, Isn't it's like great? super tender, uh, yeah. nice and flaky, almost like tempura-like. Mm -hmm. Really, really delicious. And honestly, I use the mild salsa and it's still kind of spicy. How are you doing? Mine is kind of spicy. Um, incredibly flavorful. His blend of veggies and this and this and the salsas that he make together make this thing incredible. It is incredibly flavorful, that's yeah. true. So we're here at Salazar and we're having a couple of cocktails and we're gonna talk tacos. Now Sydney, we went to four of the best taco places in Los Angeles and now we must decide together which one was the best taco. I have never made a decision this hard in my entire life. Between your wedding, Easy. moving to LA. No question. This is the hardest one. The hardest, but we have to do it for you guys and I wanna see what was your favorite, so let's do it right now. Okay. All okay, right. ready. On the count of three, we'll reveal to each other and to the world our favorites. One, two, and three. Really? Really? I'm actually shocked by that. Why? I just, I don't know. I just, that wasn't even like, I mean, it was delicious, but not like on my list. Oh, no way. This one like totally blew me away. So obviously we have a disagreement, so it's taco talk time. With these guys, that carnitas was like something I've never had before in my entire life. And after we did these four taco tastings, this is the one that I have like thought about. And like when I think of tacos, I think of this one. Huh. And I already have like planned to go back to get more. I mean, it is very good. It's like fatty, it's greasy, it's rich, it's mm -hmm. delicious, it's yeah. filling. Yeah. But I think as far as like what I want to eat like regularly, what I want to go get and like feel good about eating, and maybe have like one or two and not feel like heavy and sleepy. That's funny because we're thinking two different things. I'm thinking like, what's the best one I've ever had? You're thinking of the one you would want to have frequently. Yes. I think the time and effort put into a Sonora Town, like all in, is so different and unique uh, compared to everything else you can get in LA. Like I've had mm. like lots of good carnitas, mm -hmm. but as far as an all around taco, the tortilla, the meat, the way they chop it, the way she goes to Mexico to get the flour, I think yeah. like overall, this is my favorite and the best one in LA. Fine. <laughs> I changed my mind. Did you really? Sonora Town's the best. Sonora Town's Can we the just best. get graphics to put Sonora Town across there instead? <laughs> okay. Well, that was fun. All right, that was easy. Sonora Town, winner. I'm Harry. I'm one of the insider producers here in the UK, and we filmed some best of the best episodes, and I'm going to recap some of my favorite moments. So burgers was actually my favorite episode to film, just for the simple reason that burgers are my favorite food. I've actually been back to the winner several times and I've recommended it to a bunch of friends and they've all confirmed that it's one of, if not, the best burger that they've had. Wow. That's unlike any burger I've had before. Hey guys, I'm Harry. And I'm Ju. And today we're on a mission to find the best burger in London. Because we've done our research and we've had to narrow it down to four places. One which is really big on Instagram, another one which is highly rated on TripAdvisor, and two of the critics' favourites. We're starting our journey in Wimbledon, West London. Let's go check out the first place. Yeah. <laughs> what we're looking for in an ideal burger is for the patty to be flavorful and juicy, the toppings that work together, and we want a good, solid bun that's strong enough to hold it all together. Our first stop is Dip and Flip, which is famous for its unusual pairing of beef burgers with a side of gravy. So Dip and Flip uh, started up actually September 2013. Our signature burger would be our uh, Dip and Flip beef, which is a cheeseburger with a beef patty, and then you have slices of roast beef or lamb dipped in gravy on top of the patty. It's got white cabbage slaw, pickles, mustard, and ketchup in there um, in a brioche bun. And then to add to that, you've got uh, some really beefy gravy on the side. So normally you'd pick your burger up, you'd dip it in the gravy, 
Or if you want to go really hardcore, then you will literally pick your gravy bowl up and you'll pour it all over the top of your burger. And then the beefiness of the gravy just adds a little bit more of a meat flavor to the whole um, experience. So this is the dip and flip beef. One thing that will probably tell you all you need to know about this burger is that they serve it to you with a roll of kitchen towel. I've never seen a uh, burger that's been so wet looking when it's arrived. Right. Let's dip and flip. Okay. <laughs> so romantic looking. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. That's unlike any burger I've had before. Oh. <laughs> okay, do you give me your first impressions having tasted the, the dip yeah. and flip? Uh, my first impression of the bun is that it's really fluffy on the inside, but it's quite like a closely baked brioche bun, so it's got um, a really nice crisp on the outside. Pickles in there are nice, kind of add a sharpness and a great texture to it. Um, but I think, yeah, just a, the overwhelming feeling is that it's a, the gravy is very meaty, and uh, and I'm loving that, absolutely loving that. So the burger that they do here is a smash patty, which is actually not that common in the UK. It's more of an American thing. You kind of associate it with Shake Shack, which is where you kind of put this ball of meat on the hob, smash it down really thin. What it all comes down to is they've built a burger which can withstand the amount of moisture that comes from the gravy. And I think the smash patty kind of helps that because you get the crust, you kind of keep the texture and it doesn't all just blend into like a, a gooey mess. It does actually still stand up in the patty, which is great. After indulging in our gravy-covered breakfast burger, we head on a train from southwest London to central London to try the Venemu, which is a venison and beef burger from Scottish restaurant Mac and Wild. We sell more Venemus than anything else. Uh, that is definitely the most popular item on our menu. Originally it was just game and wild meat that I did, that was exclusive. So I thought, let's, let's create a kind of gateway burger, um, having uh, dry-aged beef and wild venison. And I, I don't, like, I don't like, like melding them together and making one patty, so I like to have two individual patties. And some caramelised onions, a bit of cheese. And then we've got our special house sauce that I accidentally created called Red John. So that's red, red currant jelly and Dijon mustard. I mean, that's the kind of sweet, savoury element that you get on the, on the base. And our, our customers, they do love it. They keep on coming back. Like, everyone keeps coming to have the Benny move. This is a Benny move. When we were seeing this being cooked, we saw that there were caramelised onions going on top of the venison patty and beef patty on the grill and then steamed. And that is what I can smell the first thing coming off the top of this burger is this gorgeous smell of caramelised onions. And it's also, I think, a little bit in the back because uh, the back we saw uh, toasted on the grill. So we can actually see that it's got soaking up the juices from everything that was on there before, like a really, really nice kind of toasted caramelised coming off this burger, which smells so good. I mean, like, visually, this thing looks amazing. It's kind of like everything a Big Mac wishes it could be and look like. This is, like, taken to another level. In terms of you've got the double patty going on, those smashed patties, which are nice and thin and crispy. Cheese just kind of, like, oozing out of it. And as you said, this, you can just see the kind of flecks of, uh, of the jelly as well and caramelised onions. It just looks really great. Oh, hell yeah. No, the first thing that I taste just inside of the, uh, the bun here, it's like a gorgeous jam taste. Um, it's like, it's really great that there's no tomato in this burger, but I can just kind of taste the jam just in the top of the bun and also mixed in with mustard. It's, um, it's kind of like a, a really nice 
You know, like, um, like a jam roly-poly you used to have as a kid? A roly-poly is a traditional jam-filled British pudding and is prepared in a similar manner to a Swiss roll. Utterly delicious. That really satisfying childhood taste of jam. Really pure and very delicious. It's nice, and it's not making burger too soggy as well, which I'm liking. Yeah, the sweetness of the jam is really useful because obviously there's a lot of like richness in this burger. You've got the cheese, you've got the meat, you've got the, the quite gamey venison. So to have a bit of sweetness to kind of cut through that is, is really nice. For your first taste of venison, what do you think? Honestly, it's good. It's, it's mostly beefy in kind of taste and texture, what you're used to from, from just a beef burger. Um, maybe with a bit more of a kind of like, I, I, I say richness in that it's not like heavy, but it's definitely got more kind of like, I guess like irony flavor that you're used to uh, from, from really like from real red meat, but it's nice. Because the first thing that I heard about it was, okay, it's game, so I think that it's going to be quite heavy and I think that it's going to be very filling and very rich, but it was very light and like you said again, irony. Um, good, I actually like the taste of venison. Um, yeah. Next, we took a short walk to our third stop, Burger and Beyond. It's a recently opened burger restaurant which had a humble beginning as a street food store. I think we sort of knew that we could go for the restaurant. We sort of got some great feedback from the customers. We knew everyone sort of loved what we were doing and that's when we knew to take it to the next step. So the BBB is our bacon butter burger. It consists of 45 day aged beef patty, pancetta bacon, double American cheese, our burnt butter mayo and some pickled onion. So I think people love the BBB is just because it's just a really well executed burger. It's, it's, it's very simple, it's just a well done bacon cheeseburger. The meat cooked perfection, the bun toasted perfectly and obviously with the added burnt butter mayo which really adds an amazing kick and then the crisp of the pancetta which also adds a really nice texture and it just makes yeah, just a really, really good burger. Burgers are some of the best in London that I've, I've had, to be honest. Um, they're like perfectly cooked, the, the bun is great, and like when you do this, and all of that lovely sauce just comes out. It's just the messiest, dirtiest, best tasted burger I've had. First bacon burger of the day. So uh, just look at this, it's really photogenic. I mean, you could just picture that on Instagram. It's exactly how it looks on Instagram. This looks gorgeous. You see the slice of American cheese in it. Uh, see the crispy bacon on top, and then this burnt butter mayo at the bottom of it. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is like you said. It's very like photogenic. If you kind of imagine what a cheeseburger should look like, this is probably what comes to mind. If you had like a cartoon cheeseburger, it would look something like this. It checks all the boxes visually. Hoping it tastes as good. Mm. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that sound effect. <laughs> that sound effect. <laughs> it looks juicy from the outside, but as you can see by the amount of sauce all over my face, everything in there is just dripping. There's some really great oils coming off the uh, the bacon and the and the burger. There's a nice melting load of cheese in there. The mayo is seeping into the back of the burger just here. So you can see it's slight, it's retaining its it's retaining its shape. It's not quite collapsing yet, but it's it's liquid and it it still smells that salty smell of the pancetta and you get a big bite of that. It's so good. Yeah, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like and the crunch of the onions as well. Mm. I just needed a moment to compose myself there. Yeah. That was just like <laughs> That, that's really, really good. I got the the burnt butter mayo. It does taste really like buttery, very luxurious. The saltiness from the bacon as well works really well. But like you said, we, this is the first bacon burger we've had today. Bacon usually goes hand in hand with cheeseburgers. And again, this is just a fantastic example of this. It's like smoky, it's salty, it's a bit crispy. It all just works really, really well. I would get divorced for this burger. Like, I'm not married, but I would, I would marry someone just to leave them for this burger. Um, oh God, just hello. We head to our fourth and final stop, Honest Burgers. They dominate TripAdvisor in London, taking eight out of the 10 spots on its best burgers list. 
The Honest Burger is our, it was our first burger we ever made that was like, we felt it ticked every box and it's just a, it's a very simple bacon cheeseburger. And so we start with lettuce and pickles on the base, which is a nice bit of crunch and the pickles give you a nice bit of sharpness. Um, and then it's our Honest Butcher's patty with a mild slice of cheddar. Again, cheddar's just got much more flavour than, say, an American cheese, so you get something from it, it's not just kind of a texture. And then nice crispy bit of dry cured smoked streaky bacon on top, um, so you've just got a nice salty um, kind of hit, and bacon makes pretty much everything taste better, we think. Um, and then a sweet relish, uh, which works really, really well with the cheese and just kind of cuts through a lot of the, um, the fat. So the reason I like Honest Burger is they ask you how you like it cooked, so you can have it how you want it. I like that it comes with a brioche bun. It's, you know, it's a decent burger. We're on our last stop of the day. We're here at Honest Burgers. Um, we're feeling a bit, yeah, kind of feeling fine. Yeah, not feeling as bad as I feared I might. The good thing is that I think like burgers are one of my favourite foods, so I'm actually kind of still looking forward to eating this, even though it's the fourth one of the day. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, it's not a smash patty, but it's still like reasonably thin, and it's still cooked on the flat top, and we did kind of see it getting a nice crust on the top. Actually, going to make a cheese judgment on this one as well, because obviously we've tried burgers with slices of American cheese, or we've tried an American cheese mix, which has been kept at a really high temperature. Uh, this one's got some British cheddar in it, and being from the West Country, I think I'm going to really enjoy that. That is, that is a decent slice of cheese in there. Um, it's not too, I mean, it's kind of, it's held together really well. It's, um, the bun has a nice kind of texture to it because it's been toasted, but it's not too claggy. It's not sort of too like, brioche -y. It's, um The meat inside there is just excellent quality. I really get the, I get the red onion relish. That's really nice. It's got like a sweetness to it from the kind of caramelization that you get from that. Pickles as well, again, just, classic ingredient in terms of the saltiness and the crunch that they offer. Yeah, I think the bacon is the right side of crispy as well. It's just like, it's, um, it's, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's like too chewy at all. Like it's just a really good bacony taste and with the caramelized onion as well, this burger is both kind of very meaty and very sweet at the same time. A very easy to eat burger. Mm. It's good. Obviously we're here to talk about the burger, not the fries, but this is the first burger we've had that actually comes with fries by default. Um, which is good, you feel like you get more of a meal for your money. And, uh... Yeah, it's rosemary, salted, smell great, tastes great. Now it's time to decide which burger is the best of the best. It's a lovely sunny day here at Tower Bridge. Now clearly some time has passed since we last went filming, but uh, it's time now to pick the best burger in London, or what we thought was the best burger in London. Cool. One, One, two, two three. three. Burger, Burger and Beyond. Beyond. We got a winner. <laughs> it's a clear winner. A clear winner. <laughs> a unanimous um, vote. So why did you pick Burger and Beyond? So the short answer is that since I tried the Triple B at Burger and Beyond, I haven't stopped thinking about it. That is just kind of everything that I want from a burger. It had those smash patties with the crisp on the outside, the juiciness inside, melted cheese, and that burnt butter mayo sauce was just out of this world. It was honestly incredible. What about you? Uh, so I picked a burger because it was just juicy as hell. It was so juicy, it had butter dripping all over it. And I feel like the actual quality of the patty itself was the tastiest one that I tried. Um, I saw the stall at Glastonbury Festival after I went, after we went filming. And, um, and I just told everybody like, you have to go and queue for this burger, you have to go and keep this burger. And honestly, if I had dropped on the floor of the festival, I would have picked it up and kept eating it because it was genuinely that good. If you guys know how dirty Glastonbury Festival can get, you know how high praise that is. So we've crowned the Burger and Beyond Triple B as the best burger in London. But that's just our opinion. What do you guys think? If you have a favourite burger in London, let us know. Next up is Pastrami Sandwiches. One of these places ended up going out of business when the video went up, uh, which is a damn shame. I'm going to be honest with you, going in, I already had my favourite, but I kept an open mind and tried all four spots. Hey everyone! 
everyone, I'm Milana. And I'm Heron. And today we are traveling around New York City to find the best pastrami, pastrami sandwich. sandwich. I love, 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 love pastrami sandwiches. There are pastrami sandwiches basically sold everywhere throughout the city. True. They are found in bodegas, mom and pop stores, and just giant restaurants that have been around for over a century. Yeah, and we narrowed it down to the four major spots you should hit. And being from New York, I've heard of some of these places. And some of these places we basically mm -hmm. picked out off mm -hmm. of just good old fashioned mm -hmm. internet research and cross that's about it. Yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, All yeah. right, well, I am starving. <laughs> Let's go. Our first stop is Harry and Ida's. Located in the East Village, it's a sandwich counter and general store, best known for its modern take on the pastrami sandwich. The best pastrami sandwich come to Harry and Ida's. Oh, I said a so Harry and Ida is my great-grandparents and uh, they had a delicatessen up in Harlem about 70 years ago and me and my sister Julie opened this place about five years ago just to keep, the, keep it alive. So the traditional pastrami in New York is uh, beef brisket and seasoned with coriander, garlic, sometimes a little bit of allspice and plenty of black pepper and salt. If you want to get really traditional, then you hand slice it and throw it over a rye with mustard. But we don't do anything like that. I'd say our pastrami is definitely a little bit more unique. For one, we're one of the only places in New York that still smokes it by hand ourselves. And we're using the fattier part of the deckle. It's like a more marbled steak. And I would say our ingredients are a little bit different. We have things like fish sauce in it to all sorts of other crazy spices that you wouldn't typically find. For me, I, I wanted to change up the bread. I grew up with it, I've had it before, but we wanted to be something different. We put on a pretty generous amount of uh, anchovy mustard and a buttermilk fermented cucumber slaw with toasted rye berry and a huge amount of fresh dill on top. You're getting a lot of the old flavors, but it definitely comes in a totally, totally different form. The toughest part is to get traditionalists and purists to actually try the sandwich because people get very offended that we don't have rye bread or traditional mustard on it. But always without question, once we get someone to try it, they're hooked for life. Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, first things first, let's try the pastrami by itself. Pastrami by itself. Got it. That marbling Whoa. and thickness. Okay. Mm. Shall we? Yep. Okay. I don't think I've ever been this happy in a very long time. I have to say like, First bite reminds me more of like like a steak or like a dinner than like what I think of like, you know, thinly sliced pastrami. This is more like a meal. I'm more curious about the bread. Yeah. And before this gets any colder, let's take a bite. All right. Mm. Oh my God, this is it. Is this cucumber? You should swallow before you Oh talk. my god, sorry. <laughs> the the pastrami is so thick and so fatty that the dill and the pickled cucumber cuts through that richness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you killed that. You ate it faster than I did. Mm-hmm. More mm -hmm. <laughs> alarm. Our second stop is Katz's Deli a New York City staple and arguably the most famous pastrami spot we're visiting. It's the best. It's the best pastrami ever, anywhere. I think what makes Cat's pastrami the best is the way they cut their meat. It's, it's the cutters, they, they have the magic. It's the very best. If New Orleans has been used, New York has pastrami. This is Jake Dell. He's a fifth generation owner at Cat's Deli. And if you're talking about pastrami, there's no better place than Cat's Deli. Not just me, but our customers think that we have the best pastrami sandwich in the world because we cure it ourselves, we smoke it ourselves, it's done the old-fashioned way. We've never changed the recipe here at Katz's. It's, it's the same flavors that you would have had in 1888. When you first come in, you get a ticket. That's your everything. So if you don't have a ticket, we put you to work. And maybe 30 years later, we let you leave. The ticket to order, the ticket to exit. Bring them back on the way out. Stay here with us, guys. We charge a $50 fee plus whatever you want. Bring them back when you're done. Thank you. Welcome. Then you go down the line and start figuring out what you want. It's cafeteria style. Twenty-two. Nah. You can pay for this. Wow, that's deep. 
And then you go to the cutters. When you get to the front of that line, you better know what you want because we'll yell at you a little bit. Pastrami on rye. Pastrami on rye. I don't like being yelled at. But uh, the pastrami on rye. Yell at, yell at her. We were told he would yell. The cutter's gonna give you a nice taste of that pastrami. Get you excited for the real thing. Free samples. This is by Costco. You can't compare this place with Costco. There's only one real way to eat a pastrami sandwich, in my opinion, and that is on rye with a little bit of mustard. That's all you need. Oh, oh my God. Gifts oh, away. God. All right. All right, that way. All right, how do we even oh, find man. a seat? <laughs> <laughs> this was probably like the first place I've had a pastrami sandwich like ever, and now it's one of my favorite foods. <laughs> really? So, what about you? Uh, I've never been here. My parents have been here. But so you're from Long Island. Okay, I know. I don't get out much. <laughs> Let's see if it lives up to the hype. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. It just oozes juice. While I like my pastrami very thin, mm -hmm. I appreciate the thick slabs here because it just has an extra hearty mouthfeel. Right. I want to try this with the mustard. <laughs> What? <laughs> that was cute. As Alana struggles, I shall teach you how it's done. Go for it. Bro, you just like, that was like some snake moves. You ever mm -hmm. see like a snake? I am so happy right now. This is gonna be pretty hard to beat. Our third stop is David's Brisket House in Brooklyn. It was once Jewish owned, and now it's owned and operated by a Muslim family. To be honest with you, the reaction is they always say it's a five star, it's better than cats. People always talk about David's Brisket. You have to go try the pastrami. It lives up to its billing. There's a review on Yelp. It's a Jewish guy, he came in here and uh, he said the same thing. He was very skeptical about the food but then he wrote a big review saying he wishes his mom never catch him doing this. It's like a taboo. We can cook it in two process. We do in a steam on a 350 degrees, and then after we finish cooking it, we let it stay, turn off the heat, and keep it in there. I mean, it is time consuming, but it, it's worth it's worth, uh, it's worth a while. My personal opinion is when you cut it with a slice machine, it tastes a lot better. It holds its juice in it. But when you cut it thick, um, it just doesn't taste sandwich-like. It tastes more like a, like a meal. Three, two, one. Mm. Mm. So when I first took a bite of the pastrami by itself, again, the seasoning stood out, but I didn't think it was you know as juicy as the ones we've had before. But in the sandwich form, all the juices that were on the meat keep getting caught within each other. I agree. It's like... um. You know those like stone waterfalls? Yeah, yeah. So like if the juice is the water and the stones are the meat, it's just like all up in there, all in the crevices. Yeah. We are such great food reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the pastrami here has a lot more of like a seasoning right. taste. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the, the meat here is as like tender. Right. But you're still getting that very hearty fatty, marble taste every time you take a bite. I could probably do with more pastrami. Our last stop is Second Avenue Deli in Murray Hill. The kosher restaurant has been family owned since 1954 and is known for its Jewish deli classics and modern menu items. So Second Avenue Deli is surely my favorite restaurant anywhere to get deli, to get anything. This would be my last meal if I ever had a last meal that I had to order. And we came up with what we consider is the right recipe, and we think we have the best pastrami in the world. The secret is the spicing, and in the preparation, and the steaming. Just, it's a combination of many different factors in getting it just right. We slice it so fine, they, they, it just tastes better. Whoever does the slicing has to know what he's doing. Like see? literally you can see through it. Yeah, you can see even through. You see? Thin little slices like it's a melt in the mouth. Look, people come in here and they can't eat just a little bit. And we know that. 
And that's why we make it super thick. I'm coming in here a little biased. Okay. Because I come here at least once a month. Once a month, Heron? <laughs> when I look for a great pastrami sandwich, I want that rye bread to be super duper plush. I want that meat to be fatty, juicy, and well marbled, and have like the exterior seasoning to just like really shine through through each bite. And I get that here every time. It is consistent. Well, I kind of want to try it now. You're going to have a bite of this and just be like, this is it. Jeez, OK. So good. Mm. OK, the seasonings aren't just flavoring the meat for me. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, they were like adding that crunch and that texture. They steam the pastrami here for a longer time than other places because it like just makes it even more juicy and moist. Mm -hmm. Try wow. with the mustard now. OK. Is there any meat left in this? What you, you smeared the whole thing with mustard. Just the top part? Fine, I suppose. All right. Mm. OK. This is a sandwich for the gods. Does it doesn't get any better than no, that? No, OK. Straight up, the sandwich was like 9.5. Mustard made it like easy 12. The moment you've been waiting for. Oh my god. All right, this was really hard. I think this was probably like one of the hardest episodes that we shot so far. I'm so sick of pastrami. <laughs> I'm so sick of pastrami. Let's decide which one was the best. Alrighty, I already have mine. I already know what it's gonna be. I already know she's gonna be wrong. One, two, three. I knew it. I'm disappointed. <sighs> so predictable. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so why do you think that Second Avenue Deli is the best? Why do I know that Second Avenue Deli is the best? I, I said what I said. <laughs> Second Avenue Deli always has, always will be my favorite pastrami sandwich in New York City. It's consistent, it's good every time. I love the thinness of the pastrami. I think the layering of it just really makes it for a very satisfying mouthfeel. It still sticks to its fruits of like just that classic, iconic pastrami sandwich. What about you? Why did you pick Harry and Ida's? Well, I'm glad that you admitted that Second Avenue Deli is and has always been your favorite deli, so you admit your bias a little bit. No, I, I came in <laughs> with an open mind. That's good. Oh, uh, no, like. Thinking about it, what, what you said makes sense, you know? The meat is cut super thin, it is very juicy, it is very seasoned. I definitely see why you made that choice. Mm -hmm. However, for me, it's 2019, and I think it's time to sort of, you know, modernize the pastrami sandwich. Okay. I personally love the seasoning on Harry and Ida's. I agree with it you. It was flavorful. The meat itself was so juicy and marble. It literally tasted like brisket. Oh my god, it was just melting your mouth. And then the bread itself, I personally, you know, after tasting all of the pastrami sandwiches, I don't think I'm a big huge fan of rye bread. You're pitting against a new sandwich with it's like with like an a, a perfect staple. OG sandwich. Okay, so Alana, do you concede? Do you want to debate more? Someone's got to give. All right, all right. For this one time, but I guess for this one time, I'll have to concede. Y'all, there are more episodes here. I just I'll want to concede. A tally. It's twice now. Whatever. <laughs> I guess. I guess I gotta give it to Second Half Deli. It's Second Half Deli. All right, guys. You heard it here first. Buffalo wings are an American classic comfort food. There is no question about it. And buffalo wings are not going to get any better than the city that started it all. So Alana and I went to Buffalo to try out four different stops. And one of these places, I would go to Buffalo in a heartbeat just to get another bite at. like lick the sauce off this plate. Hey guys, I'm Alana. Hi, I'm Heron. And today we're in Buffalo, New York to find the best buffalo wings in the city. Now, if the name doesn't give it away, Buffalo is the birthplace of buffalo wings. In fact, they don't call them buffalo wings here, they just call them chicken wings. 
And today we are going to be starting our journey by visiting four places, one of which actually invented the buffalo wing and three others that are just highly revered local favorite spots to get chicken wings. Right, and me and Heron love our spice, but to make it fair, we're only gonna order medium in all four spots. And afterwards, we're gonna decide which buffalo wing is the, the best, best of the best. best. All right, let's go. Let's go. For our first stop, we had to visit the original Anchor Bar. We want a crispy wing mm -hmm. with a juicy inside mm -hmm. and a sauce that is decadent, yet still tangy, yet still has a bite and a heat. People love to come to the Anchor Bar to eat our chicken wings because they originated here. I'm in sales and whenever I have customers that come in from out of town, of course because we're from Buffalo, they think of chicken wings and I bring them here. A great buffalo sauce is ours at the Anchor Bar. It's the original. It's, it's the one that was created in 1964. Teresa Bellissimo was the mom cooking in the kitchen and Dominic was the son bartending at the bar. And his friends came in about like two in the morning and were hungry. Dominic asked Teresa if she, she could make something and the wings were sitting next to the, the stock um, of the soup. She took those, fried them up, made some sauce. She was Italian, so she made some nice sauce and seasoned them with the sauce, and we always say the rest is history from there. Some restaurants tend to just do a hot sauce and butter mixture, but a true buffalo sauce is a cayenne blend of seasonings, and the original buffalo sauce is a medium sauce. As a buffalo wing lover, this is a pilgrimage we needed to take. It's, yeah. Dig in? Yeah. Visually, looks like the buffalo wings we grew up eating. Yeah. Cheers. Ooh, it has a nice heat. I don't get the heat. Really? <laughs> you don't get the heat? Sure. I got the heat. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on the wings? I love the wings. I think the sauce is really, really good. I mean, there's nothing else that I've tried in the past that compares to this. Mm -hmm. It's not Ooh. as like buttery as I was expecting it to be. It's, it has a bite to it. It has a bite to it. <coughs> the heat kind of crawls. The one thing that I will say, though, is I wish that the skin was a little bit crispier than it is. Right. Like right here, maybe this is just one wing, but I feel like it's a little soggy. What about you? So it was just very juicy to me on the inside, which is super important to me. And I love this spice. This is a medium. The only thing, I agree, I need my crunch. I'm not getting my crunch. Yo, but that sauce is sauce everything. Is right. That sauce is so good. Now, the next stop that we're going to is an unofficial, official competitor of this place. Our second stop is Duff's Famous Wings. They're famous for their award-winning sauce that hasn't changed for over 40 years. We've won everything. All the awards are on the wall. All the awards are on the ceiling. We've been winning local awards for chicken wings since ever. The rivalry between us and Anchor Bar, which obviously invented the wings, I think is more of a city rivalry. The city has pitted us against each other. Most people feel like Duff's is more of a local favorite than Anchor Bar, because Anchor Bar, I think, is more of a tourist trap. For students from UB, they're the best wings they have. Nothing compares. Nothing compares. It's the oldest family-owned chicken wing restaurant in America. I'll take his word for that. They're about 64. The wings went crazy from Anchor Bar to everywhere. And so we thought we'd put it in just to have a little snack food for our drinking crowd. So what makes our chicken wings different from a lot of other places, we order a certain size of chicken wings. And there's a specific size of a wing that we want when we bring them into the restaurant. So then when, when we get these wings in, they go through a meticulous sorting effort from our preppers. A lot of wings don't make the cut. Once they're prepped, we end up taking them to the kitchen, frying them for a perfect amount of time. One of my things was don't be cheap on the sauce. So a lot of people would come in from eating other places and they would say, this medium is hot. A lot of places add cold sauce to hot wings and that makes no sense. So our sauce is always being heated. The cooks are making sauce from scratch pretty much for every order. 
They use a base hot sauce and then adjust with butter. When they come out, because the sauce is hot, it creates this like huge plume of steam. You would think that we would be kind of sick and tired of chicken wings because we went to the first stop and ate so much, but I'm so excited for this. The steam is just billowing basically and it looks stunning. First of all, these are the medium, and I already smell the spices yeah. coming off of this. The, at the, the acidity, the tanginess, you're, it's like wham bam in your face. That's very good sauce. Yeah. Is it? That's such good sauce. That's such good sauce. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, there's definitely some meat on this, but the flavor is still there. It's not just pure. Are you okay? No, I'm not. Oh, it creeps up on you. The spice does creep on you. But I'm bit. not getting any creep. Nope, not getting any grape. It's a lot smoother than I'm used to, you know? They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. It's so good. Favorite thing about the swing is how juicy the actual meat is under the crispy exterior. It's still crispy. Every nook and cranny of the wing is just doused in sauce, and it still retains its crispiness, even though it's kind of been sitting here for a few minutes. I don't know, this sauce might be the deal maker yeah. here. I would say I have a high spice tolerance. This is a good medium. So we've had Duff's wings. We've also had Anchor Bar wings. Which do you think is better? I think I have my my personal favorite, what I think is better, but I'm not gonna reveal it to you just yet. Okay, all right. Maybe. What about you? I don't know, I think I have one too, and I have a feeling what you're gonna say. I think we're gonna agree. I think we are. I think for the first time. For the first time, time ever. Our third stop is Gabriel's Gate, a staple restaurant situated in historic Allentown. The menu has a spread of American flair, but the wings are the talk of the town. This is Chef Wayne Mosby. He's been working at Gabriel's Gate for over 20 years. Why are the chicken wings here, back? The secret of what we do before we toss them and the way we cook them and everything is timed. Everything stays the same. Only thing changes is the day and the time. Oh yeah, we stand behind them. Put a lot of pride, a lot of love into them. We're gonna pull them up out of the grease. Gonna add a little margarine to it. Turn around, we're gonna add a little bit of Frank's hot sauce. Toss them around in the bowl and plate them up. Add a little bit of our extra secret sauce to it. And here you have some of our best famous chicken wings. All the other places that we went to have really, really high reviews, and this place also does too. It's just hearing it from locals. locals. This was the locals' favorite. The moment these wings came to our table, it was like oh, a plume of steam, smoke. kind of like Duff's. Yeah. But the the heat, the acidity, it just hits In your nostrils. nostrils right away. Oh my god, it smells so good. And we only ordered the medium, so I know. imagine the spicier ones, like. I already smell the spices coming off of this. And, and they're like, saucy. Oh, they're yes. real saucy. They don't hold back. But I do want to point out that some wings are mm. not uniform. Uniform. But I kind of like that. It's kind of like charming a yeah. little bit. I got like, bone. <laughs> That's why I don't like I like consistency. Can I just like lick the sauce off this plate? <laughs> oh my god. I see why this was recommended, man. Like, this sauce, I'm sorry, it's unparalleled. I'm gonna be honest. I was a little apprehensive. Yeah. Because I thought that so much sauce would not allow the wings to be crispy. It's so crispy. And the chicken is juicy. Like, Less juicy than other places. Yes, it's less juicy than other places, but it's still really juicy. But still pretty juicy. Of all the places we went to, the medium here is the spiciest. So far, I think that these are the most flavorful mediums that we've had. Flavor yeah. alone. Now mm -hmm. talking about the consistency. When it comes to flavor, I think this has more of a vinegar taste, but one other place comes to mind when it comes to like bold flavors. Okay, I know exactly which place you're talking about. Our final stop is Barbell Tavern. It's a popular restaurant equally famous for its beef on weck as it is for its chicken wings. 
So at the Barbell, what's unique is that you can have both buffalo specialties at one visit. So beef on whack and, and the chicken wing. Neither of which we invented here at the Barbell. We just like to say we perfected both. I literally pretty much bought a house here because of the Barbell. Basically the pleasure dome of all wings. Barbell was founded in 1967 and my wife's Uncle Joe uh, was a mechanical engineer at Bell Aerospace and he actually had no restaurant experience but always wanted to run a bar. Bought this bar and basically made it what it is today. He was very technical when it came to how he made chicken wings. So instead of pouring the chicken wings into a, into a bowl is that we apply the sauce with a paintbrush so you get the same amount of sauce on each side of the chicken wing. So each time you bite into a barbell chicken wing, the flavor is exactly the same. Our, our medium flavor is really unique and really special, but holds true to the original buffalo formula incorporating Frank's hot sauce. The wings do not sit in sauce. They actually uh, are presented five flats, five wings. So you get to you know, experience you know, the chicken wing in, a, in an extra, you know, what we would consider a reverent way. Okay, so last stop. I'm chickened out. My insides hate me. Yeah, oh yeah. All right, we gotta do this. I'm really curious to see how the hand-painted aspect of it will like add to the actual wing, right. or if it doesn't, I don't know. Right, like the plating itself is gorgeous. Beautiful. Like, they look like they put a lot of care into each and every wing. Hello. <laughs> I have to get my vegetable intake somehow or another. Sorry, folks, I need that fiber. Oh. It's like there's sauce on every inch, every crevice of this wing. I don't know where the heat is. Yeah. I think this wing is probably one of the crispiest wings we've had. Right. And I'm hearing the crunch every time I take a bite, which isn't usually possible with super saucy wings. Because you know the sauce kind of like lessens the crunch. Well that's the thing, I want more sauce on these right. wings. They're crispy, but the sauce is so good I want more of it. Mm. Yeah. I think I agree with you on that one. I think if we were to do this trip over again, we would have just gotten spicier wings. Because I feel like we just both like spicier wings. Sorry, just the thought of doing this trip over again is hurting me. Oh yeah, absolutely <laughs> not. We will not do this again. No. We will do this at, maybe at another time on leisure, but we will be only going to one place instead of like 10, five, four. We went to four. There is a torrential downpour outside, so we couldn't do our, our conclusion outside. We're actually um, stuck in an airport <laughs> waiting for our flight, but we have a decision to make. Yep, um, going in, I thought one thing, my mind completely changed. However, I'm really confident with my decision. I am too. All right, let's, All right, let's it. do it. One, two, three. Knew it. We finally we agreed. Finally. That means something. <laughs> when I first went in there, I'm like, how could anything beat Anchor Bar? Because, you know, they invented the buffalo wing. For me, Duff's just hit all my markers. It was super crispy on the outside, super juicy on the inside, and the saucy. sauce everywhere. That, that did it for me. I was torn between Gabriel's Gate and Duff's yeah. because they're both very saucy wings but Duff's had a little bit more of a point for me because they actually made their sauces from scratch. And also, the wings at Gabriel's Gate are not as um, uniform. uniform. You don't know what you're gonna get. Exactly. The painting was cute, the selection was cute at Barbells. Yeah, it tasted familiar. It tasted familiar, but it was, I wanted to be wowed. Yeah. Duff's did it for me. Yeah, that was a good way of putting it. So, here you have it. Duff's is our winner. Best of the best ramen in Los Angeles. Every spot we went to was great. Got to go to a bunch of different neighborhoods. I liked how we got to try different types of ramens. Um, one of the places we went to was in like a really swanky neighborhood. I saw Jamie Lee Curtis out getting coffee. And the other time I saw the guy who plays Mick Steamy on Grey's Anatomy. So I was pretty stoked about that.
Joe, LA is known for having some of the best ramen in the US. That's what I've heard. We're gonna try it all. We're gonna try tonkatsu. No idea. We're gonna try skemen. Never heard of it. We're gonna try shio. Sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. Since Joe and I are somewhat new to Los Angeles, we called in a ringer. Meet Mark Hoshi. He's a former ramen chef and runs Ramen Culture. His mission is to help people understand more about the ramen industry as a whole. We talked to Mark and combed through the usual suspects like Eater, Yelp, and Instagram to find the absolute best ramen in LA. There are endless varieties of ramen, and we wanted to showcase the wide swath of options available in our fair city. Despite the difference in broth and noodles, we're looking for a few key factors, which Mark helped break down for us. So to make a bowl of ramen, you, you need five elements, five components. Number one, the noodles. Number two, the soup. Number three, the soup base. Number four, the topping. And number five, the aroma oil. Ramen has always been innovative. So if you live in Tokyo or if you live in the northern part in Hokkaido or southern part in Kyushu, they all have their own version of ramen. The reason why is they get different ingredients in different regions. Ramen doesn't have to be this way or that way. I feel like it's your bowl. Our first step is Daikokuya, which has been an LA staple since 2002. It's known for its rich pork-based tonkatsu ramen, and there have been lines out the door since it opened. Daikokuya has been around before the ramen craze. So people who lived near Tokyo or people like me who's Japanese, when you wanted quality ramen, it was usually Daikokuya. There wasn't much like ramen restaurant around at the time. Then we had a kind of fast restaurant that specialized in ramen, especially curry, uh, before it became even popular like right now. I love this place, the ramen. Amazing, like it's one of the best places I've ever been to for sure. Like, and I eat a lot of ramen, so. <laughs> the tonkatsu broth is made with actual pork bones for maximum porky flavor, and it simmers all night long. Then, for the signature daikoku ramen, they start with shoyu, or soy base, and add the tonkatsu broth. The bowl is finished with chasu pork, bean sprouts, scallions, bamboo shoots, an egg, and sesame seeds. This looks incredible. It smells like pork fat. It smells perfect. Allow me to embarrass myself by trying to do this the way it's supposed to. I like to do it what like put a do? little broth in here. Uh -huh. And then I like to put a little noodle like in my spoon. Uh -huh. That's like my favorite way to eat ramen. I know that some people like to slurp, people like to do a lot of other things. This is what I like to do because I just feel you get like soup uh -huh. and noodle in the same bite. Okay. I'm just gonna do I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do this one. Mm. 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 Oh yeah. Wow. It's really fatty, really rich. That broth. Oh, that broth is amazing. Mm. But like low key, I'm gonna add a little bit more garlic into mine. I like it to be stinky. The, the noodle just with the broth. Absolutely incredible flavor, right? And then the second hits your lips, you're like, yep, I can see why. Everyone's standing in line and wants this, you know? The noodles are perfectly al dente. They're nice and chewy. Um, and I like that they're like a little uh, curly, so they like mm. pick up on all the broth. I've been eyeing this pork for a while. We saw my guy slicing it back there. Look at that, look at that perfect piece of pork. Which camera one? Camera two? Camera? Look at that pork. What's the pork taste like? I'm about to go in. You explain while like I eat. perfection. <laughs> It's a bit of a fatty cut, but because it's been simmering so long and this broth melts in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. If you're a ramen newbie, I don't know where you've been, but this is a really good place to start. Oh, P.S. They also marinate this egg in pork fat, so I'm sure it's going to be really delicious. Yeah. Take a bite of this. Oh man, you see how it's jiggly? Yeah. I think that means that there's a runny yolk in there, guys. Anticipation's killing me. I'm just floored by this ramen. I mean, I went to Japan and had lots of ramen there. But this one is like, oh wow. This is like the bog standard for ramen in Los Angeles, and it's a lot to live up to. Our next stop in this ramen journey is Okiboru in Chinatown. 
It was listed as one of the Michelin Bib Gourmand restaurants for 2019, notably for its scammon style ramen. And I'm notable for not knowing what that is, but I'm excited to find out. Sukimen is actually uh, dipping ramen, so noodles are served on the side, and they are, they are cold, and you dip it into a hot broth and eat it that way. It was invented in 1961, actually, by a man called um, Kazuo Yamagishi. In Japan, basically, we have soba noodles. And what they would do in the summer is cool down the soba, buckwheat noodles, and dip it in dashi soup base. And they were stupid up. So he made the ramen version of that dish and called it the tsukemen. We wanted to make our own noodles because we wanted to match it with the broth. Because, you know, after testing so many different types of noodles, we realized that um, for the broth we were making, we wanted a particular flavor. So we wanted to be able to, be able to control that instead of just purchasing them. Uh, it is a lot more work, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think you'll notice the difference between fresh noodles and something that was purchased. Their noodles are exactly how I like them, like al dente, and it has like that bounce, that shoot. I'm here at least once a week. Like this week, I'm here. I, I was here Tuesday, and now I'm here again. Skemen soup is more concentrated than other types of ramen. It can take okuboro two full days to cook and reduce its soup. And the soup we're eating today is made with what exactly? We're eating the pork-based broth with seafood today, but you can get chicken or veggie too. And uh, what exactly is happening here? The broth is cooled, and since it's reduced so much, all the fat congeals. It gets heated to order and mixed with the ramen base. All right, I'm gonna show you guys how to eat this. Great, okay. I need so help. First, the lime is actually for the noodles. So you're just gonna squeeze the juice on there. Okay. Okay. The broth is uh, rich, so the um, the lime juice helps with balance it out a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. And then you're gonna take some of these noodles. Uh huh. It's gonna be a I'm test the worst with the sticks, yeah. man. I'm the worst <laughs> with the pork, sticks. Just let me know. Oh god. <laughs> so like, what's the right amount of noodles to get pick up? You, you know, for me, I like to just do like two, three bites at a time because okay. if you put too much, it's gonna cool down the broth too fast. Yeah. This gets a little messy, but with sukimen ramen. S slurping is a uh, part of it. Really? The louder you slurp in Japan, the more you're enjoying your meal. <laughs> the people love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready, Joe? Yeah, let's do this. Mm. Wow. What do you think? Mm. That is flavorful. That really mm -hmm. packs a punch. This is the first time I've had a dipping ramen. Yep. And I already have noticed mm -hmm. that with the broth being kind of like stuck to the noodles because it's so much more condensed, you get way more flavor. Yes, yes Because usually exactly. when I eat ramen, you know, it's almost like a bowl of soup. And I could be doing it wrong, but I'm just <laughs> like like doing, doing doing one of these things and oh, trying yeah, yeah, yeah. to kind of lap it in there. The pork in the broth. Oh, I've already eaten it. Oh my goodness. Compare <laughs> <laughs> that to the pork that's also in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. I'm bad at solving. Wow. It takes practice. Does it really? <laughs> I mean, clearly. So this was uh, quite the different ramen experience, I think. I think so. I have not had this style of ramen before, and I absolutely loved it. Now, it's time to drive to the west side and hit up Santoka Ramen. It's another LA favorite that's located inside Japanese grocery chain Mitsuwa. The signature salt ramen comes with chasu pork, mushrooms, bamboo shoots, scallions, narudumaki, and a salted plum. One thing I appreciate about Santoka is when I go to New York, or New Jersey, or Boston, or uh, here in LA, they have multiple locations, but their flavor doesn't fluctuate. So it's consistent. That's what I really respect about them. So I'm dumb. Is this actual food or is this fake? Is this fake? Yeah, okay. They did, we did the video about who makes this, right? Yes, we did, but it's really funny that you would think this is real. So you have to wait until your number's called, and they just called our number. Don't stand up there. <laughs> so let's Clog go. it up. Get my ramen. Right. I'll hang out here. That's for you. Thanks. That's right. That's for you. Thank you. <laughs> Stop it. Not even my mom. Here's yours, this is mine. All right, I get it, I understand. Wow. 
I like that a lot. Oh, I love it. And you know, it's not too salty. The really like nutty flavor I'm getting from the sesame is interesting and really delicious and a nice break from like the really, really heavy fatty broth that we've tried so far. Let's try this. Whoa. Pork. The pork's good? Great. Pork is fantastic. Wow. Mmm. You know when you get like an Italian sub with like broccolini and stuff like that on like a nice roll? I wouldn't get that, but yeah, I understand what you mean. First of all, it's delicious. You should absolutely try that. Second of all, this is what it reminds me of, like a nice like Italian roast pork. The noodles are chewy, perfectly cooked, absolutely delicious. It's it's um, a nostalgic kind of ramen, I think. It's definitely, this is the kind of ramen that I remember trying like for the first time ever. The noodle consistency, like these really thin ones, you know, almost like the instant ramen you would get, by the way. Instant yeah. ramen is the absolute best. I love it, so that's not a dig on noodles or instant ramen. It's not at all. But what I like about this one is everything is really coming together yeah. perfectly, just creating this experience where you get a little bit of everything. We saved the most gut-busting ramen for last with Sujita Annex. They serve Jiro-style ramen here, which can sometimes have up to 1,600 calories per bowl. Yikes! The style is basically known for their thick noodles and also their rich, fatty pork broth with shoyu base, and it has bean sprouts and cabbages as a topping. After I eat a bowl of Jiro, it's like a bad hangover. It's good. You're having a good time eating. It's amazing. But then you realize you ate too much. The acid's right, the garlic's right, yeah. I mean, you, you smell for a little bit afterwards, but it, it's worth it. I think garlic and uh, fat makes the best broth, and people love it. I wouldn't say there's a right way to eat ramen. Sujita Annex and Jiro style ramen as a whole is known for adding extra pork fat to the broth. It's so fatty, you can pick up pieces of fat with chopsticks. So we have ourselves some Jiro style ramen. It's got extra back fat on the top. <laughs> <laughs> extra back fat, please. Yep. It's really, really rich. It's not, I don't think, advisable to eat a whole bowl by yourself, but I see some great souls around here that are kind of going for it. There was a sign that said each you have to get one, so I think people we're getting used to just splitting one. They're like, nah, 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 It's nah. rich. This is the richest ramen we'll have on this adventure. Wow. Mm. There is something extra special in here, aside from all the fat. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's delicious. The pork, as thick as it is, melts in your mouth. It just falls apart the second you bite into it. All right, I'm gonna go it for it. It is so juicy and soft. Right? Oh my God. This mm. is sensational. The pork itself is incredibly flavorful. And a little sweet on the outside too. The noodles, they go up like lightning fast because they're just dripping with fat. I was a bit, to be honest, visually I was like, oh no, thick noodles. These are awesome. But these are actually pretty incredible. All in all, like for as heavy as this is, it's delicious, it's rich, it's fatty, it's greasy. It's almost like the junk food of ramen. You think so? Yeah, absolutely. And now it's finally time to choose the best of the best. All right, so we've eaten a lot of ramen. A lot of ramen. Four kinds of ramen. Four great kinds of ramen. And now we're picking the winner, the best ramen in LA. Let's do it. And I look at my phone, because I don't want to spell it wrong. <laughs> Sid, life's about hard choices. And we have to make an incredibly hard choice. Mm -hmm. Which of the four were the best of the best in Los Angeles? I felt like it was an easy choice for me. Okay, I did not. Really? I was down, there was three that I was like, that on any day could be the best one. I had to really think about it. All right, ready? Ready, one, one two, two, three. three. Uh, I knew you were gonna pick that. Why'd you know? <laughs> you have better handwriting than me, Thank I will you. say. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so, we gotta break this down. Okay. There can only be one. There can only be one. Um, the reason I'm picking Okiboru is 
those handmade noodles, man. Mm -hmm. They were so good. Yeah. I love that you could add lime to the noodles. I loved that citrus element to like the rich uh, soup. I don't even remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I really just, you know, I loved dipping the noodles in the broth and like getting a good amount of everything in one bite as opposed to trying to like, you know, figure out how to get like soup and noodle in the same bite. Points off for that place for the exact thing that dipping. I know that's the style, but for me, this was first of all, a classic ramen bowl. And also, I mean, hey man, the, the whole thing was super fatty and that makes it taste really good. The second we tasted it, I was like, oh man, I know this probably isn't the best for me, but this flavor is incredible. It's just something about it just cranked it up to 11 for me. And every bite with the broth, the meat, the noodles, everything was just soaked in this rich fat that I just couldn't get enough of. We have to decide on one winner. Yeah, okay. And the reason that I'm going to go ahead and agree with you and yeah. pick Sujita is because it was my second favorite mm -hmm. and it is really, really delicious. And Okiboru is skemen, which people could potentially argue is not like a traditional ramen. Fair enough. Um, and Rujiro style is not as well known as it should be and absolutely delicious. So we can go ahead and declare Sujita yeah! the winner. Yeah! You hear that Sujita? When I come in, I want a table right away. I'm not waiting. I just hooked you guys up. So shooting the pizza episode was a bit of a roller coaster. We filmed it all in one day. It was the first one we filmed outside of London. And it was also like a record breaking European heat wave going on at the time. I've got to give a huge shout out to Claudia, who co-hosted this episode, and to David, who was the cameraman, because without their organizational efforts, this would not have been possible. Welcome to Naples. Hey guys, it's Harry. And this is Claudia, and today we're in Naples, Italy, in the birthplace of pizza to find out which one has the best one in town. So there are over 3,000 pizzerias here in Naples, and pizza is a huge part of the culture. We've used TripAdvisor, YouTube, social media to narrow it down to a top four. We also spoke to a local expert that has eaten hundreds of pizzas in his life, and uh, he's gonna give us his take on what a real Neapolitan pizza is. So pizza from Neapolitan is a kind of a ritual. We cannot wait to eat the next pizza and we just dream about that all the time. A typical classic margarita is made with tomato sauce, fior di latte cheese, some basil, and you can add also some pecorino if you like a more rich flavor. Now it's really warm, it's really early, but I'm excited to eat some pizza. Should we go? Yeah, let's go. Our first stop is at Gino and Toto Sorbillo, which is located in Naples' historic city centre. Sorbillo maybe is the most social pizza place in Italy and in the world, because the owner, Gino Sorbillo, is very well known around the globe. He likes to experiment using some biological flour and try to push more in terms of ingredients, in terms of atmosphere in the center of Napoli. Per me il mio lavoro è una missione da portare avanti. Sono orgoglioso di poterlo fare, di poterlo anche reinventare cercando di cosa che faccio ovviamente da sempre di personalizzarlo a modo mio, facendo capire che anche sui lavori tradizionali e su prodotti tradizionali si può, come dire, dare un tocco artistico e un grande tocco anche di personalità. We joined Gino Sorbillo in his kitchen to show us how he makes his version of the perfect margherita pizza. Una velatura di farina sotto, perché noi siamo pizzaioli, non siamo panettieri. Lo mettiamo un cucchiaio e mezzo o due cucchiai di pomodoro San Marzano. Prendiamo il basilico che già abbiamo lavato e che abbiamo asciugato, non deve contenere acqua. E poi abbiamo del fior di latte di Napoli. 
per ultimo mettiamo un filo di olio extravergine di oliva In pochi secondi, forse neanche un minuto, noi abbiamo diciamo, la trasformazione del prodotto, abbiamo la pizza napoletana, abbiamo Napoli nel piatto, abbiamo una storia da mangiare. This is a sorbello pizza. What's it look like to you, Claudia? Wow, it looks incredible. I mean, just like look at all the colors in here. I love the fact that the mozzarella is like sprinkled all over and sort of like mixing with the tomato sauce. Do you know about the trick that you have to fold the tin? Interesting, okay. I've never actually believed in it, but this, a, this, this makes it look slice. like, oh, look at the juices coming out. That's it. Cheers. Cheers. Just like biting into that basil leaf, it's so refreshing. I love it how it's like all one flavor. Mm. Like they all mix in together like so heavenly. Yeah, they really do. I got a lot of the tomato. That's like that kind of acidity, sweetness from the tomato is really, really good. The, the pizza itself is like building up like from the actual crust to the tip. So you find the crust is like thicker and then of course there's less juice but it's still like very soft on the inside and crunchy on the outside and then when you reach the tip it's just like all the flavors come in together and kicking at the same time and uh, you just reach that like perfection. Next we head to Starita a pizzeria which is run by four generations of the Starita family, who famously made pizza for Pope John Paul II in the year 2000. Starita is another historic place. It offers many, many different kinds of pizza. In any shape, so they have a, a horn pizza, horn fried pizza, it's very nice to try. And uh, the owner, Don Antonio, is a master of marinara. Credo che sia la pizza migliore di Napoli, io sono di Napoli, è buonissima, digeribilissima, e mi sento a casa. Io sono Antonio Starita, la terza generazione della, della pizzeria Starita. Io la divido in, in tre step. Il 30% è l'imbasto. Senza fare i conti, acqua, farina, perché è una cosa viva e c'è molta differenza tra un imbasto e un altro. Un altro 20% o 30% è dovuto agli, agli ingredienti che mettiamo sopra. La manualità e gli ingredienti si dividono nel 30% del resto della bontà della pizza. Il 40% io dico che è il forno perché questo mestiere nasce come fornai in effetti, eh, il forno è a legna, il forno è a legna anche si, si porta avanti non con il termometro ma con, con l'occhio e con, con la praticità, questo fa sì che la pizza napoletana si differisce da tutte le altre. It seems like there's maybe a bit more cheese than we had at Sorvillo, or at least it's kind of like, it pulls a bit more. The crust looks incredible. The crust is a bit more like pronounced on this pizza. I think as well it looks a bit more uniform, like all colors sort of blend perfectly together. The tomato sauce looks brighter, <laughs> just like looks slightly more red. Wow, that tomato sauce is really kicking in. Mm -hmm. That hits you. So, uh, as we mentioned at the start, like this dough has got such a nice color to it. It's got that kind of like leopard spotting going on, which again, just like all of that is flavor, because that's just coming straight from the oven, straight from the wood, going straight onto the pizza. It's maybe a little bit more like chewy and dense than the one we've had before. Yeah. The pizza toppings themselves, like they're quite richer, I think. Mm. 
um, apart from the tomato, like the mozzarella is just like more in volume. So I think you need like a stronger, stronger base to hold it. And then also, did you notice with this one, we didn't flip, we didn't flip the tip. There was no need for it. I mean, there was still a lot of juice coming out, like a bit of oil, a few drops. So I quite like that. So I appreciate that. <laughs> We now head out of the city center to visit Pizzeria La Notizia. La Notizia is far from the center, but it's a nice place because the owner, Enzo Coccia, is a kind of a bible of pizza. He knows everything about the pizza, and his kind of pizza tends to have more high quality ingredients, so the price is higher than other places, but it's worth it. Il pasto molto leggero, una buona pizza, una grossa varietà di gusti e i prodotti freschi, quindi con piacere troviamo, quando troviamo posto perché è sempre molto affollato. Facciamo una pizza napoletana che ha un rispetto della tradizione, però guardando al futuro nel, nella qualità della pizza anche come alimento per il benessere dell'organismo. Allora, guarda la manipolazione, naturale, leggera. Ci andiamo a mettere il pomodoro San Marzano. Ci facciamo un bellissimo giro. Ci andiamo a mettere un po' di fior di latte di agerola, tagliata a listelli, che fila. Ci andiamo a mettere un po' di basilico, una spolverata di formaggio e andiamo a fare il 6 e voilà il sole nel piatto welcome to Naples This one, the crust looks a lot more like evenly browned than previous ones, where in, in the past it's been kind of like pale in some spots and then quite charred on the other. This is more like an even golden brown, which is interesting. So one thing they do here, uh, similarly to what they were doing at Starita, is they actually add some pecorino onto, onto the pizza, which to the sort of the purists might be a little bit controversial, but I'm interested to see if it kind of like adds another layer to the, the classic margarita. Yeah, I have my doubts because I'm not a big fan of like, grated <laughs> cheese on pizza, especially because there is already mozzarella in there, which is like the cheese for me. So, well, let's see. You don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> let's try it. Mm. Yeah, you get quite a lot of the pecorino, actually. I quite like center. it. Do you like yeah. it? Yeah, it's not too bad. Like I had it with um with like a lot of my or the basil leaf on the on my slice and um, they blend it together quite well, like the basil and the pecorino. It adds obviously it's, it's a lot more like sharp compared to just mozzarella, which can just kind of blend into the sauce and other stuff. So you actually get like a cheesier taste from it. Yeah, yeah, the first bite is definitely cheesy. What do you think of the crust? I think it's good. It's got more chew to it than say sorbillo did. Um, but I quite like it, it's chewy and again it's, it's useful because it just holds things better if it's got a bit more like strength to it. It's quite interesting because I don't know if you notice like this one has like it's quite similar in terms of like the way it looks to Sorbillos yeah. but then its texture is, is quite like it's just it's just another game mm. like it's um, it's much more uniform and like it's um, it has a stronger bite yeah. it's just definitely har slightly harder I would say. Next, we head to our final stop, Antica Pizzeria da Michele. It's known for its huge pizzas, and it shot to fame when it was featured in Eat, Pray, Love, starring Julia Roberts. Da Michele, of course, is uh, very famous for the movie Eat, Pray, Love, but also for his style. It's called in Italian a ruota di carro. It's like uh, a wagon wheels. It means nothing in English, but it means that the, it's so big, it's bigger than the plate behind it. 
l'antica pizzeria Michele di Napoli è un museo, è il tempio della pizza napoletana, sappiamo che gente viene da tutto il mondo proprio per sedersi ai tavoli di marmo per mangiare le uniche due pizze che facciamo, la margherita e la marinara. L'impasto lo facciamo con una farina caputo blu, un impasto diretto, assolutamente semplice. Viene una pizza a ruota di carro particolare, no? la vedrete, cioè molto ben stesa per dare alla gente che viene a mangiare l'impressione visiva che sia grande, no? che sia grande quindi l'opulenza, il fatto di saziarsi, eccetera, eccetera. Noi usiamo pomodori 100% italiani, pomodori che vengono dalla Calabria, pomodori che vengono dalla Puglia, ma sappiamo la provenienza, fior di latte assolutamente di agerola, e per quanto riguarda l'olio, noi non usiamo olio evo, come dicono tutti quanti, noi usiamo olio di semi di soia. Quindi l'olio che si mangia sulla nostra pizza è un olio in colore, è un olio che non sa, cioè che non copre il sapore praticamente della pizza. È molto sottile, un pasto non lo so, ha qualcosa di diverso. E poi tutto sommato molto semplice e alla fine più gustoso. This might be the best looking pizza that we've had today. I think in terms of like they've really got the the kind of leopard spotting on the crust just really perfect. It's a lovely golden brown color, but you've got a lot of these charred spots going on. The distribution of the cheese looks quite good and you've got the basil as well. It just all looks very picture perfect. Yeah, that's true. And uh, and I also like the fact that you can see like the tomato sauce sort of sort of like fading into the crust in here and getting like sort of orangey. Yeah, I agree like, you know, if you want an instant shot, this is your this is your pizza. <laughs> Are you channeling your uh, inner Julia Roberts? How much of a relationship are you having with this pizza right now? I'm like in a committed relationship with this pizza. We're thinking about buying a house together. Yeah, yeah, I like this a lot. I was also, I was interested to hear that they don't use olive oil here. They use uh, soy oil instead. You get the kind of texture that we're used to, but I think, I mean, I can definitely taste a bit more of kind of the mozzarella, I think, and the tomato as well. So I think it's a pretty good idea. Yeah, definitely. There was no oil at all in the bite that I just gave. It was really just like all the juices from the mozzarella and the tomato. Really couldn't taste the oil. Yeah, I, I think the crust definitely isn't quite as doughy as we had at La Notizia. Uh, I've had to bring the flip back to kind of make sure that it doesn't fall apart on me too much. But it's good, it really is like, it's less about the crust, more about the, the toppings and like the freshness of the tomato. Now it's time for us to decide which pizza is the best of the best. So here we are, we are standing in front of Mont Vesuvius, which is Naples' iconic volcano, and it is time to pick our winner. We've eaten some amazing pizzas today, and picking a winner is going to be really tough but I'm fairly confident in my decision, so uh, I think we should see what we picked. One, two, three. Ah, okay. Oh, uh, okay. yeah, I see why you're going for that one. Okay. We've got a, uh, uh -huh. we've got a split, so let's see if one of us can convince the other two uh, to come around. So why did you like Starita so much? Well, the reason why I like Starita was like, because Don Antonio was like really, really bringing the vibe like up to the next level. Like it was such a nice character and he's like among our top four and is like really making like a out of this world, <laughs> out of this world product. And I also, yeah, I also like the fact that he put olive oil on top of it, which is something that Damika doesn't have. So you make some very good points. I went for Damichele because it just kind of had everything that you would expect from a traditional Neapolitan pizza joint. The vibe in there was great as well. It was very traditional. You had the kind of tiled floors and tiled walls. It still looked the same as it did back when Julia Roberts had a relationship with her pizza back in Eat, Pray, Love. Um, so I think kind of if you're a tourist who's coming to Naples and looking for a Neapolitan pizza, I think that would give you maybe the best like touristy experience. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that like maybe Damichele was what Starita is now about like 20 years ago, you know, when like the owners were still like actually there making the pizza, you know, you were getting in and you were welcomed by like the old guy that was like very passionate about their work and then they were showing you around, you know. To me that is like really, really important to have not only the product but also like 
the person that makes it that like really really strongly loves it and uh, it's still kind of like there looking after tradition. I think I'm gonna have to agree with you. I think if you want a really authentic experience, Sterit is the place to go just because Don Antonio loved what he did so much. It really did show and the pizza had olive oil which apparently is a deal breaker for Claudia. Yeah, no olive oil, no party. In this episode about deep dish pizza, we ate a copious amount of cheese and just a ridiculous amount of sausage. Every pizza place truly was so, so good. And now Chicago is one of my favorite cities, hands down. No trip to Chicago is complete without a slice of cheesy, saucy deep dish pizza. I'm Alana. Hi, I'm Heron, and today we are in Chicago to start our journey to find the best deep dish pizza in this city. We know what we're looking for. We are looking for a buttery crust, mm. hearty, robust sauce, ooey gooey cheese, and at the end of the day, that slice needs to maintain its actual shape. It shouldn't be this right. wet, sopping mess. So the four places that we picked are just undeniably extremely popular, and it's further proven by websites like Yelp and TripAdvisor. Right, and then we cross-reference those on top rated lists from Thrillist, Serious Eats, and Time Out. All right, I hope you're ready because this is about to be intense. Oh boy. Are you ready to eat some deep dish? I mean, we came all this way, might as well. Our first stop is Lou Malnati's. Lou has around 50 locations throughout the Chicago area, and the restaurant empire is popular with locals and tourists alike. I'm a local in Chicago. The reason why I'm here is for Illuminati's deep dish pizza. I feel like I can really taste the difference in the, the cheese to other places that have deep dish. I highly recommend it. So Lou Malnati worked at Chicago's first deep dish pizzeria, Pizzeria Uno, and eventually Lou decided to venture off on his own and start his own pizzeria, which is Lou Malnati's Pizzeria today. It starts with our dough being patted out in a nice deep pan. That's where the deep dish comes from. And it's brought up around the sides to create a nice solid base for all the ingredients you're gonna put in. Next, you layer down the cheese. If you're first coming to Chicago and you wanna try deep dish, I definitely recommend starting with our classic if you don't know where to start. Our classic has extra cheese and our exclusive sausage blend um, and our signature famous butter crust. Oh my god. Ooh. Never gets old. Cheers. I don't I don't see how we're gonna get better from here. <laughs> this is our first stop. Just freaking slice it. The crust to me it just adds that perfect crunch. But I feel like it's not, you know, overdone. I think it cooked perfectly and it tastes buttery. The crust here is called butter crust. It's actually like trademarked. Mm. So it's one of the things we're famous for. It's actually a trademark term. It's trademark. I would too. I don't want anybody taking my coins. Mm -hmm. And the sauce. Yep. <laughs> it's the perfect balance of tart and sweet and fresh and acidic. And there's a perfect amount of fat so that every time you're taking a bite into it, you're not just getting like the same kind of consistent sausage layer that you're getting, but you're also getting that sausage fat. It's unapologetically like in there every bite. Like it's greasy, it's, it's savory, it's sumptuous, and it melts perfectly with the sauce. But I will say that while you're right, it is fatty. Um, it's not too greasy, and I think that's because, again, the sauce has that Sops fresh- it all up. Right, it has that, that fresh tomato-y, you know, like fresh off the vine. Can I be honest right now? I think the fork and knife are holding me back a bit from like getting this all but in my But just you're supposed to eat with a fork and yeah, knife. Yeah, but it's like, it's, it's just so New Yorker, down, you know? Our second stop is Giordano's. It's famous for its thick, deep dish stuffed with cheese. The deep dish, it's either Giordano's or Illuminati's. And Giordano's just has a lot more sauce. It's very cheesy and the crust is absolutely delicious. The most popular deep dish is always going to be cheese. But we do have other specialties, such as the Chicago Classic. The Chicago Classic will have pepperoni, fresh onion, bell peppers, and mushrooms. We put a layer of dough on the bottom of the pan. <laughs> a, a, a large pizza has approximately two pounds of fresh grated mozzarella in a bias. The customer's reaction is generally amazement, usually awe, lots of pictures being taken. Oh, wow. 
Oh my going. god. It's not a deep dish without a good amount of cheese. It's deep with cheese. <laughs> The oh, cheese is the absolute superstar of this dish. The cheese is so fresh and flavorful. Yeah. And so like um Is it like a salt? Like plush yeah. that it almost kinda tastes like ricotta. Mm. You know what I mean? I still taste other parts of the pizza where I don't think it's just too much. I personally don't think it's too much. The sauce is really good. Mm -hmm. It's not too tangy. It has the herbs that you can actually see. Mm -hmm. It's kinda sweet. Still has that little like puree, almost kind of consistency where you can see the tomato chunks. Um, I want to try the crust. Yeah, the crust. I just took a bite of it. It's very, very flaky. Mm. If this pizza went to high school, it would win all the superlatives. <laughs> Most likely to um, blow every other pizza out of the water. Our next stop is Gino's East. The restaurant chain opened in 1966 and solidified its title as one of the most iconic deep dish spots after they hired a cook from Uno's. Since I've been here 26 years and I've eaten it as a kid, I'm gonna tell you we have the best pie in Chicago. This is my favorite place to get deep dish pizza. I think it's just the layers, the crust is the last thing you kind of taste but you get the uh, richness of the sauce, you get the meatiness of that full sausage that's in there, and then you get that crumbly, cornmeal, kind of thick crust. Uh, it's almost like eating a sandwich in every bite. For deep dish pizza, our pizza is a secret. Um, the dough recipe was created by the cook that we brought over to, to create the pie. The sausage patty supreme kind of brings you back to the Midwest. It's a Chicago original. That is the most popular pie. Hey, welcome to Gino C's restaurant. Uh, what is it home to? The best pizzeria in Chicago. <laughs> The supreme pizza is going to be with mushrooms, green peppers, and onions. I would just like to point out that this was not intentional. Not planned at all. It's like mostly cheese. Let's go. <laughs> all right. Mm. One thing I really am feeling about the sauce is that although this is like a meat lover's pizza, they put veggies in it, mm -hmm. which I think breaks up the like the fattiness of the meat. I like how the sausage is evenly distributed throughout. I just wish that it was thicker. Oh, I love bread. Wait. <laughs> it's giving me cornbread vibes, but not like overly sweet. Not cornbread, like cornmeal. Yeah. So what, if anything, is your favorite part about pizza? Well, considering I just ate a layer of the crust by itself, I would say the crust. Really? For me, it's all about the sausage. And the sauce. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. I actually, um, compared to other places, I like that it's coated throughout, so every single bite I'm getting is a consistent bite of sausage. Our final stop is Pequod's. It's a local favorite and famous for its unique spin on the deep dish crust. Typical wait times on a Friday and Saturday night are between an hour and a half and two hours. As far as like Pequod's being recognized as a best deep dish or locals favorite, people, you know, don't associate us with a big chain, which is great. We do a Chicago pizza tour and we come here on every one of our tours due to the fact that, in my opinion, this is the best pan pizza in the city of Chicago. The sauce is sweet, you know it's a pan pizza. On the bottom, it's crunchy. The crust is phenomenal. So if you ever had, had been here, come here. So the key characteristics that make our deep dish a little bit different than anybody else is obviously the crust. This is the reason why Pequod's has been nominated time and time again the best deep dish in Chicago. Our caramelized crust is achieved by taking the cheese and laying it up against the side of a specialty pan that we use. And the heat literally rises over the top, burns the sugar in the mozzarella, and then caramelizes that cheese. 
for a first timer that's coming into Pequod's and wants to try the product, uh, we always recommend a pepperoni and a sausage pizza. Those, a pepperoni sausage combination, those work the best for us. So for us, we go a little heavy on most all of the ingredients. We want it to be somewhere between uh, overwhelming and enough thickness to cook properly. I can eat this pizza every day of my life and I just, you just, I don't know why I, I don't get tired of it. God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> These are some hefty chunks of meat. Yeah. Wait, we gotta do it together. You gotta keep up, girl. I don't think I've ever seen a one of this impatient before. before. It's so bad. All right, ready? Cheers. That was very satisfactory. My boy. From the looks of it, you're like, huh, maybe it's a little, you know, Cajun um, or, you know, burnt. For me, it adds the most perfect texture to the bite because you have all the meat and you have all the sauce and you have all the cheese, which is very, like, soft in your palate. But then the crunch from the crust takes it over the top. You're completely right. The sauce, like you said, is very hearty and robust. A little too tangy for my liking. Right. See, I like a good tang. So before we head back to New York City, can we just say that Deep Dish will forever have a special place in our hearts? Well, I'll probably go to all four of these spots again uh -huh. and do the whole pizza tour again. We gotta do this. So do you think you have a top? I think I have an inkling of an idea. All right, let's get it going. Three, two, two one. one. Oh, okay. Oh. I was gonna pick in between these two. Yeah, I was, I was stuck too. Okay, so, but for me, the reason why Pequod's had kind of just one level up was because that crust was next to none. And that sausage had this very, like bold seasoning and a kick of spice that I feel like not any of the other places had. You're right. I mean, for Pequod's, that crust was just delicious. But for Little Nani's, that butter crust though, uh, it just melts in your mouth and it's flaky and every single bite was just like savory goodness. And for the sausage, well, I did like the seasonings on Pequod sausage. I, I didn't get a sausage bite in every single bite. But in Luol Nadi's, the way that they perfectly distributed the sausage allowed for the cheese to kind of bubble up through. So then you got a nice creamy, savory bite every single time you dug it. I do have to agree in hindsight, I wish that Pequod's didn't dollop the sausage mm -hmm. on and kind of did the same thing Lou's did, where it was an even distribution of the sausage mm -hmm. throughout. So yeah, I'm willing to concede. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. What was that? Are you gonna rub it in? Uh, are you saying that I, I was right? Oh, okay. Um, whew, huh, plot twist. All right. So can you just can you just say one more time what the best of the best You're really pizza gonna make it rub it in. in Chicago is? Luminati's is the best deep dish in Chicago. Yes. <laughs> So Sunday roasts are a huge thing in the UK and we really wanted to make sure that we got this one right. But at the same time, we did manage to find a couple of places that put their own unique spin on the traditional meal. And the wildcard option actually shocked me at how good it was and it really did prove that sometimes it's worth getting out of your comfort zone. No Sunday in Britain is complete without a full gravy covered roast. Mmm. oh wow, it's so good. Hey guys, it's Harry and Jew. And today we are on the hunt for the best roast dinner in London. So as usual, we've trawled through local recommendations, TripAdvisor and social media to try and find the best of the best. So we've narrowed it down to four places, all of which put their own unique spin on the roast dinner. And we're gonna go and order the most popular thing on the menu and pick our favorite. You ready to eat? Yeah, I am. Let's go. For those of you who don't know, the Sunday roast is a traditional British meal served on a Sunday. What we will be looking for on our plate 
is some succulent roast meat, well-seasoned roasted potatoes, thick, tasty gravy, and fluffy Yorkshire puddings, which are a savoury batter cooked in a cupcake-style mould. Our first stop is the Jugged Hare, a restaurant which specialises in game. Our roast is the best because it's freshly made and the meat is very high quality. Beef is put on, um, we slow rotisserie it for three to four hours. Potatoes are then roasted in the oven along with the Yorkshire puddings and then that will come together on the plate which is carved by, uh, and with the meat, which is carved by our saucier who's on, uh, on sauce at the time. Yeah, yeah, it's delicious, yeah. You're not getting like your huge big plate of veggies, but everything that's on the plate is like perfectly cooked and worth coming from. So I think just in terms of like presentation, the way it's plated up, it gives, it's kind of like a more of a fine dining feel than maybe you're used to from like a classic pub roast dinner. But hopefully they've found a way to kind of like elevate things and it will taste really good. Time to tuck in. Time to tuck in. I think we go for the meat first. I'm not sure I've ever had beef that tender. No, that's so juicy. Like it's very succulent. It just, I, I think the way that it's been pre sliced as well, like that, it's not you know a big hearty slab of beef. It's like it's very fine. It's very thin, but it's just the right texture and just the right thickness. Right, so I think we should try it with some of this horseradish cream. Yeah. Ooh. It's so smooth. It's not over. It's not overpowering either. Yeah. It's quite a fairly gentle horseradish taste. Yeah. It's not that kind of like burn that we're used to from like a wasabi or something. Yeah. Can we try some potato. So if I'm being honest, it's probably not the best roast potato I've had. I think it's like, could be crispier on the outside. They've gone for quite a light golden brown coloring, as opposed to maybe the darker coloring that you're used to from roast potato. But credit to them in that the, the inside is really good. It's very, very light and fluffy on the inside. Should we go Yorkshire? This is Yorkshire, yeah. Wow. Sounds, sounds crispy. That is a crunch right there. The top is slightly chewy, but not too much. It's just crispy enough. I think it's extremely light. I, I want a bit of chew on a Yorkshire. Yeah. I don't want it to just kind of crack and crumble. It's going to chew good. Yeah, it's just the right amount, I would say. But overall, this whole plate has a slight sweetness to it and very light, very delicate balance of flavours. On to our second stop, Blacklock. It can take up to two months to get a reservation at this popular restaurant. Uh, the best-selling roast dinner that we do is the all-in. Uh, it's an opportunity to try all the different roast meats that we sell, so beef, pork and lamb, all on one plate uh, to share for the whole table with lots of trimmings, unlimited gravy, uh, a real feast. We start about a week beforehand uh, making the gravy. Uh, the Yorkshire pudding mix uh, gets put together on a Thursday. We then take large joints of beef, pork and lamb, cook them whole over the open charcoal grill. Um, so the meat, we feel, gets more flavour cooked as a large piece. Yorkshire puddings are, uh, and roast potatoes are roasted in the oven in duck fat. The meat will all get presented on the plate with a little, few little bits of crackling on top and away it goes. Certainly the most monster roast I've ever seen. 
Yeah, I've got to agree with you. The size of this thing is enormous. I think it's 20 pounds per person, but you get so much food. That's incredible. It's like a giant's feast. <laughs> right, I'm getting some of this beef. The first thing that hits you is the flavour of that gravy. And um, it's just a really sexy gravy. <laughs> Oh my god, it's just, it's so, it's so luxurious and so, such a strong flavour. This is a very picture perfect roast potato, so it's, you've got that golden brown exterior. Interior is looking nice and soft and fluffy. Yeah. Let me give this one a try. Mmm. Oh yeah. It's really well seasoned. Yeah. Mm. You get a really good crisp on that roast potato. I think the duck fat, they cook it in duck fat, which is like notorious for producing a really, really good roast potato and it really does show. Yeah. That's a proper Yorkshire. It's really good. It's not too soggy at the bottom, like it really retains its structure. And it's wonderfully light, wonderfully crispy. The batter's risen just perfectly. Really airy. Yeah, yeah, very light. This is actually the sexiest roast I've ever had. I'm going to continue to say the word <laughs> sexy. It's one, damn yeah. sexy. <laughs> Next, we head to Oblix in the Shard skyscraper which offers a fine dining alternative to the Sunday roast. For me, the best thing uh, about a Sunday roast is, uh, is the beef. And of course, being an Englishman, Yorkshire puddings as well. The, the beef we're cooking today is a rib of beef, and it'll be cooked in the Josper oven, which is kind of like a big, it's an indoor barbecue basically, um, filled with charcoal. It gets up to around 350 degrees, so you get a really kind of amazing caramelization, a real sort of full-on sort of smoky flavor. So the, uh, the roast potatoes we're cooking today have been boiled um, just uh, till they're just cooked uh, in salted water. And then they have been um, sort of roasted in the oven with some thyme, some rosemary, some garlic, um, some rock salt. And we use half duck fat and half beef fat as well. Tend to do slightly larger Yorkshire puddings than normal. The side dishes we, we serve at the Sunday Roast is uh, mashed potato with, uh, with garlic crisps and uh, broccoli with uh, like a chilli dressing with uh, some preserved lemon on top as well. Just helps to keep that, that side dish uh, and that vegetable nice, light and fresh as opposed to being heavy. Wow, well, talk about fine dining. This looks exquisite. Everything looks so beautifully put together. The colour on that beef is incredible. It's so, so dark. Even the fat is like really darkly coloured. Mm. <laughs> Damn, that's good. We both just like sat back. <laughs> We're just like, oh, wow, at the same time. It's just like juicy enough. Um, it's got flakes of salt over the top as well. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just salty enough as well. Mm -hmm. It's kind of taste-wise and almost texture-wise closer to a steak than to like a classic roast maybe. Yeah. Also just because of the way it's cooked on those coals, you do get that kind of like char flavor on the outside, which is really, really good. Yorkie time. Yorkie time. Mm. That's really good. It's not very crispy. And I wouldn't say that it almost has a sweet taste to it, and it just reminds you quite a lot of it being a batter. Um, it's almost like a little bit cakey in a way. I get that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I get that from it. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow, it's so good. good that has just got the right amount of salt on it, mm -hmm. um, the right amount of oil. The garlic, you can really taste the garlic. Our last stop takes us to North West London for a rather unique and portable take on the traditional Sunday roast. I was doing some work with a friend of mine uh, in street food before, so I was doing that part time for a few months and kind of realised from all the events we were doing, there's nothing British really. And then the roast dinner was the thing that I thought was that we do better as a country than anything else. And then just the whole 
Yorkshire pudding wrapping up thing just seemed like the best way to do it. You don't want a knife and fork if you're taking stuff. Checking out the menu in the Uber on the way over here, and this was the one thing that drew, drew my eye. I actually tried to make a Yorkshire pudding at home, failed miserably, but this one, absolutely incredible. So the beef wrap starts with the giant Yorkshire pudding, so we get that toasting off on the grill so it's all nice and crispy. And then as that happens, we start to build it. So there's a sage and onion stuffing goes on the bottom, followed by garlic and rosemary roast potatoes. Uh, then today we've got a bit of spinach that will go onto it. Then the braised beef. Bit of red wine gravy. Horseradish and then all wrapped up and then there is your beef Yorkshire burrito. Wow, that is a mouthful. I literally, I just bit into some lovely, really soft beef and then straight through a crispy roast potato. You know, it's a kind of texture that you really want in a great Sunday lunch. Horseradish is a classic pairing with beef in the UK with your roast dinners, because it just kind of gives you a bit of like, it's kind of heat, isn't it? Like a bit of a heat that just kind of really cuts through what can be quite rich meat, especially when like this, it's kind of had that, that braising effect in the red wine. Yeah. I was worried actually about the roast potatoes that because they're deep fried instead of being like classically roasted, I was a little bit worried about them. So I mean just to talk about the Yorkshire itself, it's not like a normal Yorkshire I've had in that it's not hugely kind of fluffy. I think the way they've kind of made it, obviously because it has to have a bit more structural integrity to hold all this liquid in, so it's a little bit sort of chewier than I was expecting, but I think in kind of the grand scheme of the whole, the whole dish, it's kind of necessary. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a classic Yorkshire pudding, um, but I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Now it's time to decide which is the best of the best. So we've had four roast dinners in London, and now it is time to reveal what we thought was the best of the best. Now, I really honestly don't know what you've picked, Harry. No, I don't know what you've picked, but I'm excited to find out. Should we reveal on one? OK. Countdown. OK. Let's go. Right. Three, Three, two, two one. one. Ooh, okay, okay. division. We've got a disagreement. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm actually, you know what? I was about to write Oblix. Mm -hmm. I was about to write Oblix. I, I mean, why did you pick Oblix? So for me, it was kind of a two horse race between Oblix and Black Block. I went for Oblix because it was more of an experience. Maybe for someone who's coming from outside of the UK and wants to try a roast dinner, I think the fact that you get to go up the Shard and just the quality of the food and the atmosphere in there was fantastic. And I just, just really, really enjoyed it. Actually, for exactly the same reasons I would have picked Oblix. The reason why I picked Black Lock is because, for me, it really defines what the idea of a classic Sunday roast is, which is a little bit more messy. Uh, you kind of get in there, it's very meaty, very hearty, and just the portion sizes, I thought it was fantastic value for money. And there's just something a little bit more kind of like charmingly rough and ready about it. It's like it's just getting stuck in there and with gravy everywhere and with the amount of beat you get. Um, I, I think that Oblix was fantastic for fine dining, but for me the idea of a Sunday roast is a little bit more rough, I think, yeah. You know what, Jude, pass me the pen. <gasps> I'm gonna back down. I'm, I'm gonna agree with you. Like I said, it, it was a two horse race. There wasn't a lot between it. And I think maybe for the more sort of authentic roast dinner experience in terms of like the quantity and getting a, your hands a bit dirty, I think Black Lock maybe just edges it. So, sorry Oblix, Black Lock's the winner. Best of the best donuts. This was maybe my favorite one to shoot because we ate donuts. Now, a smart producer would have just like taken a few bites for the camera. Not me though, I'm eating all those donuts. Los Angeles has over 1,500 donut shops for you to get your fix of hot, sweet, melt in your mouth donuty goodness. Whoa, dude.
Los Angeles kind of gets this reputation for everyone always eating healthy all the time, right? And they are. Right. But did you know that Los Angeles is also the donut capital of the United States? I actually did not know that, and I was really surprised to find out. Since the 1970s, donuts have been an important part of LA's food culture, and this city has been responsible for the evolution of donuts in the US. For this episode, I used various popular websites like Yelp, Eater, and Thrillist to whittle down the list of four of LA's best donut spots. We're definitely trying each shop's classic glazed donut, and also one or two of their specialties to get a feel for what they have to offer. Awesome, I am ready to eat some donuts. Let's do it. Our first stop is SK Donuts. Located in Mid Wilshire, SK is known for having a wide variety of both classic and premium top donuts. Our donuts are always fresh, light, fluffy. No matter what time you come, it's always consistent. For 30 years, SK has been serving up fresh, delicious donuts to hungry Angelinos. Started by Hang T's parents, it's been family owned and operated the entire time. That was really good. So we definitely got to go Nutella. Classic, glaze. Yep. yep. I want something with sprinkles on it. Yeah. Pink, Pink sprinkles. Definitely want them with the uh, with the fruity pebbles on it. Of course. Right there. Yep. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a man child. Got to have my cereal. The variety at this place is so great, and that's why I took you here. I thought the reason that Joe took me here was because my initials are SK. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start with the glazed. If you can't do the glazed right, close up shop. This is like the litmus test, is that the right thing? This is the litmus test Lit for the litmus. perfect donut. Litmus? Litmus. Litmus test. Litmus. Litmus test. Ooh. Oh, wow. The flakiness of the glaze, it's not like melted into the donut, it's laying nicely on top of the donut. So when you bite into it, you get a little bit of like a crunch, some nice texture. That guy has that thing. I'll go ahead and call that the glaze ladle. It's just like a huge thing, like a gallon of it. And he's just like, ba-bam, across like a whole dozen. And they're drenching the donuts in this incredible glaze. This is the fluffiest glazed donut I've ever had in my life. No uh, question. I gotta, dip, I gotta dip it in the coffee. I gotta dip it in the coffee. Oh yeah. That's so good. Thinking about the mic? That's the stuff. So this one has fruit on it, so technically it's healthy. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Mmm. I'm going for a strawberry. Mm. Joe just called a raspberry a strawberry. That's how much fruit he eats on a regular basis. Wait, what'd I say? Next, we're heading to LA's original farmer's market to try a true classic, Bob's Coffee and Donuts. Since 1970, it's been a must visit for anyone in LA serious about donuts. And it's cash only, so heads up. Oh yeah, thanks for paying. Yeah, okay. Bob's is known for the classics, and there's over 30 varieties to choose from. I made sure we got the big one. These feel very like classic. Even the, uh, just looking at the cake, it looks a lot thicker. It looks closer to like a buttermilk donut or even like an old fashioned, yeah. which I love. Yeah, very old school LA, very diner vibes. Uh, but we're outside, it's always good weather in Los Angeles, so you can always eat a donut outside here. Right. Oh, this looks fluffy. Yeah. Thicker, amazing consistency. Dough's cooked perfectly. The glaze is really delicious. This is about as classic as you can get when it comes to donuts. This feels and tastes like they make their own mix here yeah. in the shop. Yeah. I bet if I got in a time machine and went back to 1950 whenever this place is open, that donut tastes exactly the same. If it worked well 50 years ago, it's gonna work well today and they're absolutely right. I am so freaking excited for this sprinkle donut. Well, first of all, look at that. Yeah. Nothing falls off, maybe one or two, you're good. Look at this. But yeah, we look got this. cake. Cake yeah. donut, baby. This is a really, really light cake donut. It's not heavy at all, um, but I appreciate that it like maintains its structure as you take a bite. Bob's is awesome. I loved every donut here. Now we're headed over to Primo's Donuts in Mar Vista. Since 1956, Primo's has thrived by delivering consistently great classic donuts with a few specialties. 
We've been in business 63 years. My father, when he started the business, it was highest quality. Everything had to be of the, the utmost in terms of quality. I've been coming here for over 20 years. I don't know how great. Well said. It has also been said, Sydney, that Primo's Buttermilk Bar is the best donut in LA, so I would like to try one. You read my mind. I feel like they don't get much fresher than this. We just saw them glaze these like 15 seconds ago. They are still warm mm. and they are shiny. Mm. Oh man. I mean, the way it melts in your mouth, the cakiness of it is like so soft, you know? Mm. As a pillowy. And the glaze is perfect on this. It's less sweet than some of the other like yeasted raised donuts that I've had. And I love how you can see like all the layers. I feel like I'm biting into a donut pillow. This is so fantastic. Huh? Yeah, donut oh, wow. pillow is the right way to say that. I think the difference between this and the other ones I've had is like the uh, glaze kind of stays on. The donut doesn't crumble, doesn't crackle off. Everyone says that this is the thing to get here. They are known for these buttermilk Look cars. At the size of this. It's a heavy boy. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Whoa, dude. This is not what I was expecting. This is way better. It has a very familiar taste, but I can't like put my finger on it. Almost like um like a bread pudding or like a trace lake chase or like that kind of texture. Yeah. They must like glaze them while they're super hot and then they sit there and they get a little like wet around the outside and still nice and cakey on the inside, but still crispy. Now it reminds me of those butter cookies. You know what I'm talking about? Uh-uh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the flavor of these are way different than a standard donut because it's more emphasis on the ingredients, the dough, how everything works together, than yeah. just packing something with sugar. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, the quality here, you can tell, you can see it, you can taste it, you can feel it. For our last stop, we're going to LA's iconic donut sign, Randy's Donuts in Inglewood. Our donuts, you know, first and foremost, they're made fresh every day by hand, which is very different. A lot of other companies use machines. We use proprietary ingredients that are proprietary just to us. They are so high quality that they last longer. I'm from New York. My cousin lives out here. She's one of the best donuts in LA, so they're good. Located near the airport, Randy's iconic donut sign has been seen in numerous TV shows and movies. Sir! I'm gonna to have to ask you to exit the donut. But it's not a gimmick. These donuts are considered by some Angelinos to be the best. It's also the only spot we're visiting with the drive-through. Thanks for driving, Sid. <sighs> yep, I always drive. So what, what kind of donuts are we gonna get? What do you think? Uh, definitely gotta go glazed. Mm -hmm. Chocolate raised, I think those are the most popular two here. Yep. I think of some with sprinkles. Yep. I saw like some colorful ones, like some Fruit Loops, I think, or some kind of like cereal. Yeah, that sounds really good. Okay. Let's do that. Great. So here's your donuts. Amazing. Be coming in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry, enjoy. my arms are short. <laughs> yeah. I'll get your coffee in a second. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Sydney with the T Rex arms. <laughs> <laughs> There's not like a medium in here. No, not at all. Okay, cool. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't look. Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> So for a buck fifteen, you get this big donut. This could easily take care of me for, for breakfast. I mean, you say that, but when you eat a donut, you always want to go back for a second one, you know? Let's find out right now. Ready to bite? Let's do bite? it. Ready Let's do to it. Bite. Yeah. I'm savoring it. Let me savor it. That is fantastic. You know, you can judge a donut place by how good the glazed is, and this is a yeah, fantastic glazed it's donut. It's excellent. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go in for the chocolate. Yeah. I'm, I'm not waiting for you. You want this one? No, I'm doing. I'm doing the cake donut. Okay. That's my jam. Man. I would never go for chocolate raised. Like I you would should, never. You should. Because this is excellent. So we got cake donuts and we got raised donuts. Raised are fluffy. Cake are thick. The raised goes a little more cake, which I like. It's like a thick. It donut, is kind right? of cakey. Like the raised is the raised is weirdly a little cakey, but that's kind of great. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah and this frosting's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Joe takes the most massive bites I've ever seen in my entire life for donuts. It's like I'm gonna have one more bite, and it's like half the donut. <laughs> that's, that's two. That's two bites. Why is it that eating a donut and just staring at that Randy's donut signs like it's hypnotic? <laughs> 
Sydney, we went to four of the best donut places in Los Angeles, and now we have the difficult task of picking which was our favorite. You ready? I think we're gonna have the same one this time. I don't think so. On the one, count of three? Two. One, two, three. Three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I told you, I told you. Yeah. All right, I mean, so why did you love it so much? Everything, starting with that glazed donut was incredible, and then, of course, the buttermilk bars were amazing. I mean, I just thought every single thing that we had there was probably the best thing we had uh, while we were eating donuts in Los Angeles. Even the plain glaze, I think, was just absolute perfection. It wasn't too sweet. There was like the right amount of glaze on top. But I don't know, I feel that uh, there's only four good uh, Donut place in Los Angeles. What do you think? You think there's some others? <laughs> I think that we missed probably a lot of donut shops. We picked some pretty great ones, but let us know what else we need to go try. And until next time. So before we shot this video, I actually had no idea that London had such a vibrant hot chocolate scene. I'm not a massive fan of hot chocolate myself, but I think in a way that was interesting because then it let me be a slightly harsher critic than I might normally be on a video like this. And whatever way you look at it, all of these were fantastic ways to warm up on a cold, rainy London day. There's no better way to stay warm in London than with a steaming cup of hot chocolate. And the city has a couple of popular spots, all with their own unique take on the drink. Hey guys, it's Harry and Jude. And on this very great day, we are on the hunt for the best hot chocolate in London. So, as usual, we have looked through TripAdvisor, social media, and just plain old local recommendations to try and find four places which will be the best of the best. What we will be looking for is a hot chocolate that has a nice texture, something that's not too sweet, and its overall luxuriousness. First stop, Dark Sugars, a chocolate shop that brings the culture of West African cocoa production to Brick Lane. What we've tried to do with the hot chocolate is kind of do it in the way I know how to do hot chocolate back home. What we do is we combine um, cocoa powder and chocolate, which is um, a combination of milk, dark and white chocolate in there. So, and then we make a very thick um, paste first and then we heat up the milk, pour the milk, and then topped up with foam, and then the shavings go on top. We believe that it's the best hot chocolate because it's full of experience. We feel good when we're doing it. Cool. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Wow. Ooh. That's, that's such a lovely flavour. I, I love all the theatricality of the shavings on top of it. There's just a real kind of sense of drama for this hot chocolate. Like, you watch it being made in front of you and there's shavings going on the top. Like, you can see that the milk's being whipped up. Like, it is a really enjoyable experience, first of all, for the eyes before your taste buds. But also, this just tastes delicious. That dark chocolate has a really, really lovely bitterness because otherwise it can kind of be a bit too sweet at times, whereas the dark chocolate really does help to balance out, particularly with the white chocolate in there as well. Lovely bitterness from that. Yeah, the flavour of the chocolate, and I like the fact that obviously it's got white chocolate and the dark chocolate and milk in there as well. Um, but again, it does have sort of a satisfying wateriness to it. Like, it's not, it's not grainy, obviously, and it's not... Uh, but again, it's not just like a whole dollar of melted chocolate straight in your face. Like, it actually feels more like a drink which is what you sort of want for when you're walking around on a cold winter's evening. Second stop, Side Dal, an Italian cafe that offers a slightly thicker consistency than traditional hot chocolate. The idea came uh, around five years ago. We gave it a twist to something already successful, but then also we have been able to offer a product which uh, forced the client to go into a direction of having a different experience, which is like similar to the margarita with salt. Uh, instead of salt, we have a chocolate, three kinds of chocolate, all around the cup, so there is no other way of drinking it than 
uh, getting chocolate in your mouth, sometimes getting dirty. <laughs> when we first opened, uh, the reaction was uh, not very good at the beginning because the, the perception of hot chocolate was different, the, the expectation was different. And now, after a few years, we are very well known and we have a lot of people coming from anywhere for our hot chocolate. It's fabulous because it's, I mean, it's dark, but it's not too bitter, so it's just the perfect compromise and it's so thick. Like, it reminds me my the Italian hot chocolate that I used to drink back in Italy, so it's like, it's like being back home. Uh, I'm actually really excited to see how Harry's going to eat this <laughs> yeah. because it looks pretty messy. I'm a bit of a professional, but even I think this is going to put me to the limits because this is just covered in chocolate. <laughs> it looks really good. It smells amazing. So we've got the Jinduya hot chocolate, which is kind of hazelnutty and it kind of just smells like melted Nutella, which yeah. immediately is making me really excited. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. That is, <laughs> that is that is incredible, wow. Jeez. When I said sip, I don't think that was the right word. Yeah. It's more like a bite. It's face blonde. <laughs> face like, blonde chocolate. It's rich. It's the texture is nothing like you'd expect in terms of like a normal hot chocolate, because this is way thicker. It's so creamy and luxurious. It, it has like the texture of a churro stick because it's got that like really luxurious creaminess to it and a texture that you almost want to dip something in it. Like you just want to dip yeah. your face in it. That's what you want to do. Um, but the, the taste is lovely. Like I think as British people, we're used to that kind of very sad like hot water with cocoa powder. Like, but this really, this is Italian food. This is Italian food and drink. So it's it's luxury. It tastes incredible. to Mamasond, a Filipino ice cream parlour that uses traditional ube ingredients. Ube is a sweet potato or a purple yam and it comes from the um, sweet potato family. It's indigenous to the Philippines and it's naturally purple, that's what's so great about it. It's, it's like the vanilla of Philippines. We actually use our ice cream uh, in the winter time, that's how we actually created the product. So we're very keen on no waste and using everything that we've got. So we actually melt down the ice cream, we mix it with um, Belgian white chocolate and a bit of Horlicks, heat that up with some milk and it's perfect. And then the whipped cream itself, we use an ube jam and we mix it with um, cream. And then we have a special whipped cream machine that like makes it all fluffy and airy. And then the outside bits are um, ube wafers. So it's just a bit of an ube overload cocoa and it's perfect winter. I love the ube whipped cream because it's so pretty. I love the colour and it's the best part of the cocoa in my opinion. I eat this stuff all the time. Mm. Mm. Not bad. Oh wow. Blimey, that's sweet. It's very sweet. That's really, really sugary. Very I mean, I was kind of expecting it to be quite sugary anyway, because when I've had things like lavender or like sweet potato lattes before, they've always been really heavy on the sugar. Mmm. Okay. Ooh. I don't mind that. Yeah, I certainly get a lot of the yam taste from the flakes at the side. Um, but it's really smooth, really yeah. drinkable. It's almost like when you salt the rim of a margarita. Do you get much of the ube? Because I'm mostly just getting kind of whipped cream. It's quite sweet. Maybe like a tiny bit of kind of earthy flavour from that. Yeah, I get a little bit of the sweet potato-y kind of taste to it, like a little bit of a yam taste, but mostly from the cream at the top. Um, I'm, I'm not really getting so much of like a white chocolate taste from the actual hot chocolate itself, but maybe that's just a, that's just a sugariness of it, maybe. Would you say it's maybe outwardly less chocolatey than the other ones that we might have tried? So I think this is more about the whipped cream and the kind of ice cream and the sweetness. And obviously because it's made with white chocolate, less of a kind of cocoa taste from that. On to our final stop, Chin Chin Labs, who have created an almost pudding-like take on the traditional hot chocolate. What Chin Chin is best known for is um, creating dishes that you can't get anywhere else. Our hot chocolate is more like a hot chocolate pudding. The chocolate that we use is really expensive, French chocolate from Valrona, it's 80%. We have chefs in the kitchen making small batches uh, every day. 
and then the marshmallow itself. Uh, it's our own recipe, it's a secret recipe uh, that we make in small batches and mixes. And then when we top off the uh, hot chocolate with the marshmallow, the balance is good because the marshmallow is really sweet um, and we have that sort of toasty flavour because we blowtorch it. The actual hot chocolate itself is quite bitter, so it combines really well. So the idea is you, we give you a spoon and there's a bowl underneath and you eat it like this with a spoon. You have to get the marshmallow and the hot chocolate together um, so the balance is, is right when you eat it. I really love like the marshmallow aspect of the hot chocolate. It's so gooey so when you pop the spoon in you get the gooiness of the hot chocolate and then you get the, the quality Belgium chocolate coming through through the Valhone sprinkles so it's amazing. Go for it. How are you supposed to? How you, you just you so just go. In. I, I think we've just got to commit and go right. for it. You okay. ready? It's like a dessert. Okay. Yeah, this could go everywhere. Right. Good luck. Okay, good luck. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay. That is an extremely, <laughs> extremely Instagrammable dessert. That is, yeah. I got like a bit of marshmallow and a bit of hot chocolate. It's so lovely and shiny as well. It seems so luxurious. Oh wow. Wow. Oh, that marshmallow is so good. Mm. I'm just, yeah, that is so good. The marshmallow oh. is like really, really, it's very filling. It's not a breach. I've got a breach. It's really filling. It's not too sweet as well, the actual hot chocolate inside. Once you get down into it, I mean, this is dribbling everywhere, but once you get down into it, it's just, it's lovely, rich, um, um, very, very flavorful hot chocolate, which I wouldn't say is too overly sweet. It just has a lovely, like, luxury kind of dribbliness to it. Um, and the texture of the hot chocolate is lovely as well. So I've picked my winner, you've picked yours. I'm excited to see what you've picked. I think that we might disagree, but let's find out. Uh, reveal on three. Okay. One, two, three. 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 Sad dog. Oh. We disagreed. I knew it. Okay. I knew we were disagreeing. <laughs> Why did you pick them? So, I mean, for me, Said Dal was just like unlike any other hot chocolate I've ever had. It was the most luxurious thing maybe I've ever eaten in my life in general, in terms of just like it was so velvety, it was so chocolatey, the kind of Nutella y flavour that we got from that hazelnut hot chocolate. And obviously, that triple chocolate on the side of the cup just kind of took it to another level. And it, I thought it was just a really, really cool experience. What made you pick Chin Chin Lab? That was delicious, don't get me wrong. I probably would have picked that, but for me, it came down to the price. I think Chin Chin Labs was the cheapest one of the whole day. And for the value for money, it was incredible. The actual quality of the Valrona hot chocolate in Chin Chin Labs was more of, I would say, a drinking chocolate. But what you had in Saudal was more of a like an actual pudding. It was very dessert-like. Like, I, I would have that as a dessert rather than a hot chocolate, I would say. I, I see your point, you. This is a really tough decision. This is maybe the closest one that we've had in this series, to be honest. But I think overall, I'm going to agree with you. And I'm going to come around to Chin Chin for a few reasons. I think you've kind of covered some of the reasons in terms of like, it did feel like more of a dessert than a hot chocolate. And I think as tasty as it was, I would have hit my threshold of how much of it I could drink quite quickly at Side Dal because it was just so rich and so luxurious, which is great in like a small dose, but like you say, more of like a sit down, desserty experience than a hot chocolate, perhaps. Next up is Nashville Hot Chicken, the most painful episode that Alana and I endured last season. The spiciness of the hot chicken and the 90 plus degree humidity it, the whole time we were filming felt like a fever dream, but it was worth it at the end because we learned a lot about this iconic dish and we had a lot of fun eating at all four of these spots. Hi guys, 
guys, I'm Heron. And I'm Alana. And today we are in Nashville. This place isn't just home to great music and southern charm, it's also home to hot chicken. Yeah, and we're hitting up four major spots today. One is the place that started it all, the other is like an empire, and the other two are local favorites. We aren't just looking for hot chicken that's spicy and hurts you, we're looking for actual great flavor and bold seasoning. Right, it has to be crunchy on the outside, juicy on the inside, the whole shebang. I am so nervous. Yeah, like, my insides are gonna probably hate me after this. You and me both. But we're, we're here to find yeah. out which one's the best, so let's get going. All right, let's go. To keep it fair, we will be ordering the hot at each location. Our first stop is Prince's Hot Chicken. Legend has it that this is the birthplace of the iconic Nashville dish. What do you think about Prince's Chicken? It hot! Boy, I'm glad now. Princess is better because it's the original to Nashville, and it has the best story as to why it got started as well. My great uncle was a very outgoing, out of the box type person. This is Miss Andre Prince. She's the owner of Princess, and she carries on her great uncle's legacy. The story goes that he came home late one night, and his lover wasn't pleased. She expressed her anger by cooking up some fried chicken, but fiery chicken to match her fury. And he was probably taken back, but after it settled in, he liked it. Who wouldn't? <laughs> after that, Thornton Prince opened up a store and sold hot chicken to customers. More women eat it hot than men. That's why it had to have started with a woman. That's that fiery woman, that fire coming out of them. <clears throat> Prince's closely guards their recipe, so unfortunately, we couldn't make it back into the kitchen. I gotta make a living, I got bills to pay. <laughs> the main thing is Kayan, and that has gotten around. <laughs> Most popular, of course, is the chicken breast, breast quarter. Oh my god, the immediate tears. <laughs> I'm a fiery, fiery woman. woman. <laughs> the flavor explodes. It's not just hot. You need to try it, though. You need to feel what I'm feeling. Just Here go, goes my Just thing. go for it. Don't even think about it. <laughs> Oh no. No, you have to let, oh my, no, Heron, it's a, it hits you later. I wouldn't have probably taken that second bite. I'm doing okay. Really? Oh, the swallowing made it worse. Well, yeah, that's how, you, how one eats. <laughs> <laughs> it hits your throat. Like, in my mouth, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. I will say that in some, like, fried chicken spots that I've been to that say that they're spicy, or hot, I've noticed that the seasoning is a little bit more on the salty side, but for this one, I feel like it's perfectly balanced. I don't think it's overly salty. I definitely taste the cayenne. The cayenne to me is like the most prominent flavor. That's the thing that's hitting your like, throat, kind of makes you cough a little bit. <clears throat> I feel like the reason why hot chicken became such a staple Nashville food, because it's addictive. Like as much as it's like painful, it clears the sinuses though. This is a great way to start off the whole trip. Our second stop is Party Fowl, a newer player in the hot chicken game. While the Fiery Fowl is the main attraction at this place, it's also a full sit-down restaurant and bar. So if you're gonna do hot chicken in Nashville, one thing you need to do is kiss the ring. And there's one person in town that you gotta pay homage to, and that's Miss Andre. Well, with Nashville hot chicken being as great as it is, and starting to gain some popularity, I saw there was no full service, full bar Nashville hot chicken anywhere in the country, and I went out to try to fix that. So the awards we've been given, top five uh, fried chicken in the United States of America. We've gotten to film shows with Shaquille O'Neal, and we've been on HBO. I mean, we really run the gambit. We've been very blessed. I know how good this place is. She and I love it, come here all the time. And we had to share with our buddies from out of town. That's all the hot chicken I've ever had. That's all I need. So our classic way of serving hot chicken is we cut the birds in half and we fry the half as it is. The spices in our Nashville hot are gonna be your cayenne, which is the most important part of Nashville hot chicken. Habanero pure is what takes it to that next level. It sings a different note on your palate and it really elevates that cayenne. Most people use a thin piece of white bread. Why Texas toast? 
It's because it's bigger, it's thicker, it sops up even more of that good mud. We have three neons on the outside of our building. Nashville Hot Chicken, Local Brews, and Boozy Slushies. Boozy Slushies put the flame out. My favorite one though for that is the Bushwhacker. The dairy, the chocolate, all those notes really hammer down that spice. Okay, I have heartburn. <laughs> You could smell that there's like paprika there, cayenne. cayenne. They drizzled extra amount of like that bottom spice on top for us. So a little extra something something. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> drink, drink. I like it, but it hurts. <laughs> Is it helping at all? No. <laughs> it makes it worse. It aggravates it. This feels like the whole the whole chicken. <laughs> She's That's a good one. How is it? <laughs> the first bite I <laughs> The first bite I got was on the sweeter side, so I'm like, Karen. Are you over exaggerating? Just a little bit. And then the flavor's kind of chilled on my tongue for a little bit. It's kind of climbing up to my nose. I love how they double bread it here. Mm. It's so crunchy. They might be new to the game, like compared to Prince's, but the seasoning here is thicker. I feel like there's more of like a granular texture to it. And for that reason, I feel like the seasoning is a lot more pronounced. Right. And it almost has like a sweeter, smokier flavor yeah, than the other hot chicken. The sweetness allowed you to take a breath and really taste the flavors that are on it. It's just a good time. The food's delicious. And then you cool off with like a boozy slushy, and by the end of it, you're drinking this so much that you're probably gonna get a little tipsy. This makes just the hot chicken that much more fun and enjoyable. Our third stop is Hattie B's, known for helping spread the hot chicken frenzy from Nashville and beyond, with seven locations in four states. The chicken is the best chicken in the world. It is delicious. I come here so much that I know all the staff, they greet me by name. The great thing about hot chicken is that everybody does it differently. At Hattie B's, our menu is rooted really in uh, Southern Meat and Three, which I think is mu are as much of Nashville as hot chicken is. For us, we really wanted to have distinct heat levels so that there was a little something for everybody. My opinion is that bone-in are the most traditional and probably the best way to get it. Our seasoning is absolutely a secret. It incorporates a little bit of habanero, but um, just a heavy dose of cayenne. We tried to think of the menu a little bit as like what would pair well and help kind of bring the heat down when you're, you're suffering the most. This was a side competition. No way. <laughs> Some of the awards that we've gotten, we've won Best Hot Chicken in Nashville a couple times in the Reader's Poll. You look as happy as can be. <laughs> Do I have something on my face? Uh, ooh, that's bad. That's... My lips are burning. It like hits your nose, like, like the back of your nose. Mm. There's something sweet in here, brown sugar maybe? I think there's like a slight brown sugary taste to it. That was a really good catch. Yeah, and I think it's killing the heat a little bit. So it's like, it's a slow crawl, but even I feel like at its peak, it's not unmanageable. Overall, this is deliciously seasoned, super crispy. The meat itself is juicy, no complaints on that. If you could change one thing, what would you think of it? I think because I was expecting the hot to be like really, really hot, mm -hmm. I wish that it was hotter, which means I probably should have just ordered the damn hot instead of the hot, but we're only going across the board as hot. hot. We wanted to try the shut the cluck up before we left, just to see how hot Nashville really gets. Three, two, two one. one. It hurt yet. It hurt yet. Oh, it hurts so much. <laughs> Does it <I> end? <laughs> Does it end? <laughs> Our final stop is Pepper Fire, where the hot chicken is truly hot. Like hot in all caps. And the hot chicken is done in ways you won't see anywhere else. 
my eyes are watering a little bit. My yeah. nose, my nose is running a little bit, but I'm happy about it. Been here probably at least once a month for the last couple of years. You can customize the flavor, and also it's just really juicy. What makes Pepper Fire unique? We've always been flavor first, heat second. We definitely bring the heat, no doubt about that. Today, we're gonna serve you some original style hot chicken. We're gonna go breast quarters and leg quarters, and we're gonna go hot. And that's gonna be an amazing amount of heat, but still have a lot of flavor. Pepper Fire makes their hot chicken by first pouring a wet spice over the chicken. Then doubling up on that heat by dusting a generous amount of secret seasoning. I feel so sorry for my esophagus, but here we go. <laughs> the seasonings definitely hit you first. And then, oh, I feel it on the lip area. <laughs> That's like an ASMR crunch. Uh -oh. You're sweating? I am sweating. I can't tell if it's the 97 degrees in Nashville <laughs> or the chicken, but you know. Either way, it's a hot girl summer. What do you think goes into this seasoning? Definitely cayenne. Maybe vinegar on the liquid rub, because I'm getting a vinegar. smell that? It made me cough. That's the cayenne. I feel like there's vinegar in there. Can we know? There's no vinegar in here. I think there's cumin in here. Mmm, you're right. I think you're right. You have a good palate. Thank you so much. She does. So do you. Except for the vinegar, you know, mistake. <laughs> We're here to pick the best of the best. Right. Do you have your pick? I think I have one. I do too. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Oh, okay, okay great. Okay. Yes. That was my second pick. I picked Princess not only because the recipe was just delicious, I can understand why it is top secret. The chicken was super duper juicy. The skin was still crunchy on the outside. And the seasoning, I don't know what goes into that seasoning, but it was, it was so, so good. I almost picked Princess for the same reasoning. That seasoning is incomparable. However, the reason why I picked Party Fowl is because there were other elements that I felt like shone a tiny bit more. Party Fowl had a crunchier skin. It was double fried. Second of all, the heat on Party Fowl's chicken was just like, they brought it. That was a true Nashville hot. Also, they served it with Texas toast. That's why I had to pick Party Fowl. I totally forgot about that Texas <laughs> toast. And also, I realized that Party Fowl, they scooped up that bottom mm. seasoning, gave it that extra oomph. Yeah. So as much as Prince's is a place that you have to go when you go to Nashville, Party Fowl, yeah, I'm gonna switch over to Alana and agree that Party Fowl is the best. After the hot chicken episode, we needed to cool our palates, so the next thing we did was find the best ice cream in New York City. This was the only episode that Alana and I agreed with on the first round, which is, I think, a feat in and of itself. Sweet Mother Mary, that is so good. I'm Alana. I am Heron. And today we're here to find the best ice cream in New York City. There are literally thousands of places that sell ice cream in New York City and we narrowed it down to four spots. Each spot has their own true fan following. Right, and to make it fair, we're gonna try vanilla ice cream in all four of these spots. I learned from Joe and Sydney that this methodology is called a litmus test. This is like the litmus test, is that the right thing? This is the litmus test Lit for the litmus. perfect donut. And to make this more holistic, we're also going to try their signature flavors. So we are judging on their vanilla ice cream flavor, mm -hmm. their signature ice cream flavor, mm -hmm. and the overall diverse spread of flavors that they offer. Our first stop is Oddfellows. It's home to 500 creative ice cream flavors, all centered around nostalgia. Mm -hmm. 
my favorite thing about Alfalas is that it's all made in house, all made in one location, and their flavors are like nothing else. So depending on the shop, we have between eight and 16 flavors in the case at any one time. Our motto is flavors change often, don't be mad. We do try to cycle the standard flavors through whenever we can. You'll always see vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, cookies and cream. The Brooklyn-based ice creamery makes all their ice cream flavors in a factory in Bushwick. They produce 300 gallons of ice cream a day. Chef Sam Mason is the mad genius behind everything that we do in the kitchen. He's been a pastry chef at some of the best kitchens in the world in the past 25 years and draws inspiration from all over. Vanilla is one I'm very particular about, so I've managed to make it way too expensive. We use fresh uh, Tahitian vanilla beans, and we also use a, a vanilla paste and a vanilla powder. There's a lot of vanilla in our vanilla ice cream. Okay, let's try it. All right. Ooh, Ooh and it creamy. cuts like butter. Oh yeah. The vanilla is definitely prominent. They're not cutting any corners here. I definitely understand what he meant by he uses three different types of vanilla because it's it's extremely vanilla-y. Vanilla-y? Vanilla-y. Floral and light, but still very creamy. She's a bougie, basic flavor. Speaking of flavors, let's move on to the next one. Okay. One of the flavors that's most in demand and people are saddest when we don't have it is cornbread. Three, two, one. Oh my God. I've been waiting for this moment for the whole entire shoot. I went to Hometown Barbecue and I brought that cornbread and the coincidence is uncanny and I'm, I'm so, I'm so excited. <laughs> Karen, do you have any, like, <laughs> ounce of self-control? <laughs> no. <laughs> I will say that while flavor-wise it tastes a lot like cornbread, there's no hunks of the actual bread, so you're gonna get like a really smooth, creamy bite every time. I do like cake and ice cream together, so I was expecting the cornbread to kind of act like a cake in this, but to me, cornbread and cake, they're not exactly the same texturally, and, and I don't think it would work. Together. Our second stop is Ample Hills. The Brooklyn-based parlor has shops all across the city. Their specialty? Ice cream filled with ample toppings, like cake, pie, candy, and more. My husband Brian and I started Ample Hills in May of 2011. We've always loved making and eating really fun, great, fantastical ice cream. And we also really wanted to create a community gathering space. Ample Hills is the best place to get ice cream. I'd say it's it's both flavorful and sweet. Our name, Ample Hills, comes from the Walt Whitman poem, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. But ample also means that we like to put a lot of stuff in our ice cream. We are as much of a bakery as we are an ice cream factory, so we make all of our mix-ins from scratch. But with our vanilla bean, we steep it. So it's a lot more intense and flavorful than you'll find maybe other vanilla bean. Let's go into this before it gets meltier. Uh, mm. Oh my God, that melts in your mouth. The vanilla is just so pronounced. I feel like each speck is like exploding on my palate. Like it's so good. You can even see how there are like these pockets of air mm. almost because it's so fluffy. I kind of want to bite this pretzel cone. This is a great pairing. Mm -hmm. The salty, crunchy from the pretzel, the creamy, sweet from the vanilla. If this is the blank slate flavor, mm -hmm. I can only imagine how great the other ice cream flavors are gonna be. Our top seller would be ooey gooey butter cakes, and that's delicious. Alana, what is my favorite, favorite food in the world, like the food that I gravitate towards when I'm sad, happy, just overall, just bored existing. Yeah. Cake, it's cake. It's cake. It's cake. Yep. Ooh, I see little niblets of cake oh, in yeah. here. Okay. Oh, it's like a butter pecan type. Sweet Mother Mary, that is so good. <laughs> I love this. There's so many globs of cake in here. It's a winner. 
Our third stop is Van Leeuwen. The ice cream truck turned empire is known for using only pure, simple ingredients. And they're known equally for their dairy and vegan ice cream. And I love that it's not too sweet of an ice cream. It's just this beautifully creamy, very natural flavors. Our ice cream is always free of fillers and stabilizers or natural flavors. So when you read the ingredients, it's only things that you recognize. When we started Van Leeuwen, we only did sort of very simple one ingredient flavors. So they're your flavors with no chunks. And because we made ice cream like that for so long, we were forced into becoming really, really good at sort of the rudimentary aspects of ice cream making, which is making the base. So we didn't have chunks or anything to hide behind. So if you go to a Van Leeuwen shop to get a scoop, we have 20 flavors. We source all of our vanilla from Papua New Guinea. We use both the bourbon and Tahitian variety. So really, really extraordinary ingredients and extraordinary recipes. All right, I'm gonna go for this little piece. Oh, right it here. just like kind of, uh... it cuts so, all right. You can taste just how simple and pure these ingredients are, right? It's so creamy, and it kind of just like coats your palate in a way that's so refreshing. Mm -hmm. Even though you can see the vanilla beans, it's not like an overpowering vanilla-y vanilla flavor. But here, it's like the vanilla is super milky, and like you said, there are these little flecks of the vanilla bean in it. You can just tell that this is like an artisanal ice cream. If you want something that's a little more mm -hmm. than the vanilla, I have the thing for you. It's their signature flavor, our really? honeycomb. Ooh. Honeycomb is our number one bestseller, which is so good. Okay, ready? Yeah. Oh my God. Mm. So you're getting like this kind of like salted caramel kind of taste with crunchy honeycomb bits all melded in with that really super creamy vanilla mm. ice cream. It's it's just, it's so good. It's just, it's just, oh. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our final stop is Chinatown Ice Cream Factory. It's been around for over 40 years and continues to be family operated. Chinatown Ice Cream Factory started in 1977. There weren't many ice cream stores in, at that time. We were the first one uh, in Chinatown. I really, really like about this place the fact that they'll take flavors that I'm used to. You really honestly couldn't find a whole lot of even green tea ice cream. I like how they were kind of ahead of the game in trendsetters. At any given time, we have about 40 flavors of ice cream. We have the traditional flavors. At the same time, we make flavors that are uh, a little unique and uh, more native to the people that live in this community. Durian is not my type of fruit, <laughs> but there's a huge following. We keep it covered because of the smell. Either you love it or you hate it. Do you love it? Are you a follower? I want to try. I don't know if I enjoy that. We don't let people see how, how we make our ice cream because we want to keep it a secret and special and not copied by that many people. Oh, pretty. Thank you. It's not too sweet. It's very creamy, but I will say that the vanilla flavor still stands out really strongly. Comparing it to other ice creams that I've had, while I do get the, you know, the intense vanilla flavor, I would like to see like the actual like flecks of vanilla bean, because mm -hmm. that's usually what usually sets it above and beyond for I me. I agree with you. Vanilla bean would have made this vanilla over the top. My flavor that reminds me of my childhood is the lychee because lychee was quite expensive in old days and it was like a treat. This is an ice cream cone that is just Asian in its entirety. We have a green tea cone and lychee flavored ice cream. This one's, oh! <laughs> it's more icy than yeah. ice cream. Oh, I like that combination. Yeah, it's, it's like juicy. Like I feel like I'm 
actually biting into a piece of fruit rather than taking out just a scoop of regular ice cream. It's like ice, like an icy crystallized crust on the outside. So it's not as like super milky and creamy as the other flavors that we had, but I'm not mad at it. I really yeah. like it. I feel like the reason why it is that way is because lychee is like already this very like delicate fruit. Making it really creamy would take away from the integrity of the actual flavor. It's, a, it's such a unique experience. I feel like I'm from an Asian background, but like a lot of the flavors I'm not really used to or like I crave but can't find anywhere else. So it serves a lot of purposes for me. Well, I'm glad we came here and I'm taking this to go. So we did it. We hit the four most iconic spots in New York City for ice cream. I think I have a pretty good idea of what I think is the best. Do you? All right, let's see. Three, two, one. Hey! We got it! Look at it! Yours is better than mine. Yeah, I wanted to show the hunks and chunks of all that goodness. That's in the not cups. a hunk and chunk, that's a okay. speckle. Look, ma'am. <laughs> okay, so I think the fact that we both got Ampo Hills is sort of a testament to why I actually picked it. There were so many options available. I feel like there was something for literally everyone. For the vanilla, the flavors just stood out the most. Each flavor was kind of like bursting on your tongue. Um, compared to the other vanillas, I feel like it was very creamy. It had a great texture. Texturally, when I look for a great ice cream, I want something that is extremely milky and creamy, mm. whether it's texture or for flavor. I want both. You could actually see the vanilla beans. Yeah. yeah, the vanilla bean in it. And their signature one, excuse me? Like you said, there's literally something for everyone. Mm. You have regular classics from vanilla, strawberry, chocolate, to ice creams that are filled to the brim with different types of toppings, cake, candy, chocolate, potato chips, pretzels. I mean, they Brownies. have it all. That ooey gooey butter cake oh. was so good. I brought a pint home with me after that chew. And that's the thing about all of these places. We tried a lot of different flavors, like uh, samples, but Ample Hills, it was that one place that we literally couldn't stop eating. Our last episode was in New Orleans to find the best shrimp po' boy. This was Alana and my favorite episode to film, hands down, because the people in New Orleans are so nice, the culture is like everywhere you turn, and the food was just phenomenal. When it comes to New Orleans, po' boys are one of the most iconic foods in the city. That might be the best sandwich that I've ever had in my life. I'm Alana. And today we are in New Orleans to find the best po' boy in this city. Right, and while traditionally the po' boy is made with roast beef, we're gonna find the best shrimp po' boy because one, we just like shrimp better, and two, in New Orleans, shrimp po' boys are just as popular as the roast beef ones. And we want to taste what the bayou and the golf have to offer. We narrowed it down to four different spots based off of top rated lists and reviews based off of Yelp and TripAdvisor. And when we're making our decision, we're looking for a super soft, plushy bread. The ratio between the shrimp and the bread has to be great. We don't want like little skimpy bits of shrimp in that sandwich. And it has to be super well seasoned. And we're also looking for just like a general great tasting sandwich with all the elements making sense all together. Right, all right, let's go eat. Bye. It's not a bye, we're leaving, bye. Our first stop is Parkway Bakery and Tavern. It was established in 1911 that continues to serve its classic poor boys to locals, tourists, and celebrities alike. Parkway Tavern is an iconic restaurant in the, in the city. The poor boys started by the Martin brothers, Vinnie and Clovis Martin. 
The po' boy didn't come around until 1929, the height of the Great Depression. Cars were a luxury. The main way to get around the city transit was the New Orleans streetcar. Those guys weren't getting paid, so they striked. They needed food, they needed clothing, so Benny and Clovis, who were former streetcar conductors, said, you know what, we gotta take care of those guys. We'll feed our poor boys. Real I'm Jesse Boo Boy. The classic po' boy would be the roast beef po' boy. It's a great roast beef sandwich. <laughs> Another classic is right in our backyard, the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana fried shrimp. For me, best po' boy you can get. What we do, we do a light flour, corn flour season, put it in the fryer, 350 degrees. If you have a New Orleans po' boy, you gotta get it in New Orleans, okay? Because you gotta get the bread. This bread don't like leaving the zip code. And the humidity here in the city is astronomical. That helps for baking bread. The New Orleans French bread is crispy and crunchy on the outside, but when you cut it, the inside's soft like cotton candy. Lettuce, tomato, pickle, mayo, it's dressed. That's the New Orleans lingo. A little hot sauce and ketchup, knock the tongue out of your mouth. Yes! Yes! The reason why I acted that way is because in 2013, after an epic performance at the Superdome, Beyonce Giselle Nose Carter ordered 150 po' boys from this location. Beyonce? Beyonce! <laughs> the Obamas came here. They're cool too. They run a country, right? That's pretty cool. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh! Take a look at this shrimp. It's perfectly breaded and it's almost, it's like a golden brown, so you know it's well seasoned. All right. Mm. There's that distinct um, scent of the gulf mm -hmm. shrimp. It is um, briny. It's like a salty kind of flavor. Salty, sweet. All right, let's dig in. If there's anything, that shrimp alone tastes so good, I can only imagine. Ready? Mm. There we go. It's a good po' oh boy. <laughs> the bread is flaky on the outside. Super soft on the inside. You're getting the seasoning that's in the batter itself. And the shrimp is just so crispy and crunchy. I love the proportion of shrimp to full sandwich here. I could see how this is the blueprint of what a po' boy should be. Our second stop is Johnny's Po' Boys, the longest family operated po' boy spot in the city. While their breakfast po' boys are popular, the most famous is the fried shrimp po' boy. I come here like two or three times a week. The way you fry it, the batter is really good, so I guess it gives it like a little twist to it. And I also like cheese and hot sauce on mine, so it gives the extra wow. Johnny's Pool Boys started in 1950 with my grandparents, Johnny and Betty DeGruche, and we've had it now for three generations. The Pool Boys are fabulous because of the bread. You have to start with fantastic bread, and we get ours from a local bakery, Leidenheimer. It's always going to be crunchy on the outside and really soft on the inside, which just makes your sandwich. And when you can hear that nice crunch when you bite into it, you know you've got a great sandwich. What makes the shrimp special? What sets it apart is it's a local shrimp. You have to have the seasoning and it's in your wash. You have to have it fried. I mean, you know, you can boil it, I guess, and grill it, I guess. The secret in New Orleans, everybody gets it dressed. What do you think about the breading? It's really good. I will say that I do have a couple of naked shrimps, a little bit. Also, I'm gonna need you to pass that crystal because I need hot sauce in my po' boy. I agree with you. As much as we want a bigger crunch and bigger breading, their imperfections still make it taste good. I forget what their motto is. Even our failures are edible. I mean, they're edible. I feel like they are delicious. <laughs> edible is an understatement. They put it on the griddle so that you get that crunch even on the inside layer. And then because they put the butter on it, it's like crunchy, fatty, and chewy, and flaky, and just all the good adjectives you can put on carbs. That's this bread. Before heading to our next stop, we had to squeeze in some knowledge staples.
Our next stop is Killer Po' Boys. It's a modern sandwich shop that offers po' boys in unconventional ways. A uh, po' boy to uh, me is anything that we can stuff in the middle of a loaf of French bread. There are a hundred places to get a great fried shrimp po' boy in this town. And for us, it's better to do something a little different that we're more interested in and, uh, you know, something a little creative that we can, you know, give everybody a change of pace. Our seared shrimp po' boy is the top seller at Killer Po' Boys. I think their golf shrimp po' boy is terrific. It's definitely a new take on a traditional po' boy, but the shrimp are just really big, really juicy, really delicious, and super flavorful. We've been featured in uh, numerous magazines, Bon Appetit, Playboy, GQ. So we get the uh, freshest wild caught golf shrimp we can get our hands on, the biggest ones straight off the boat delivered to us every morning. I'd say we go through about 400 pounds of shrimp every week. So uh, first we're gonna go ahead and season up these shrimp. It's a little uh, house blend of coriander, lime zest, salt and pepper. Then kind of like a Southern Asian uh, flavor profile. Next up, we're gonna go ahead and uh, quick pickle some vegetables to go along with the uh, po' boy. We get our bread from a uh, small Vietnamese bakery out in New Orleans East. It gives us a little different flavor profile. Next thing up, we're gonna go ahead and put our special sauce on it. It's pretty much a uh, sriracha mayo with uh, some dried shrimp powder, some uh, lime juice, cilantro, green onion, mint. Fried shrimp po' boy is always going to be better. Well, how could it not? It's fried. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's do right. Mm. When you take bites of the sandwich, you get like whole entire mm -hmm. shrimp that are bigger than any of the other places that we went to. I didn't think I'd say this, but <laughs> this shrimp is probably the most flavorful shrimp that we've had so far. I. I want to top that. This sandwich is probably the most flavorful sandwich mm -hmm. altogether. The pickled vegetables are so refreshing mm -hmm. and salty, sour. And the bread, it's a little bit more robust, so it's, hold, it's able to hold more shrimp, which is a plus. I do kind of miss the softness and freshness of the traditional Pueblo bread. You know what I also realized? We haven't touched the hot sauce. Crystal's is my baby. The sandwich you made just abandoned me your child. abandon my child. <laughs> it's a play on a traditional New Orleans Creole sandwich, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're putting a Vietnamese spin on it, but doing it still in a respectful and very delicious artisanal way. So I appreciate it. In the Garden District is Damalises. The restaurant has been a local favorite since 1918, and the woman who held it all together was Miss Dot, the city's proclaimed po' boy queen. I love Don Lisi's. It's my favorite uh, po' boy place in the city. I have to make a stop here every time I'm in town. They use some sort of secret sauce that I think really kind of knocks it out of the park. And I love how authentic it is. It's been here and it's kind of been unchanged for so long. It's kind of an institution. On busy nights, the wait can be up to an hour. Nothing has changed in this place. People just don't want you to change anything. They just want that slice of history and the character and the ambiance associated with it. And I think that's a big draw. But besides, the sandwiches are very good. The shrimp, I think, is the most popular. It's a recipe that we've used for generations. What makes your fried shrimp po' boys the best? I think it's uh, the way they're battered. The shrimp breading is um, water, uh, corn, flour, and then we mix, um, uh, can't tell you. <laughs> it's so soft. It's so soft. <laughs> We're big advocates of, of daily, fresh, baked French bread. We've been dealing with Leidenhammer for years. All of our dressings are mayonnaise, lettuce, pickles, hot sauce, and ketchup. And we make the ketchup ourselves. I love this place so much. It is like a place just stuck in time and it feels so homey. Everyone's so nice. Yeah, I feel like I'm literally in my grandma's living room. Look at these portions. It's huge. They had to cut it in threes just <laughs> to fit it on the plate. Man. The bread is less flaky than other places, okay, but yeah. it's definitely a lot more plush. Yes. 
there's also a good amount of shrimp in here, and it looks really, really crispy just from the eye of it. I just had a bite of shrimp. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Oh my god, I gotta go for it. I think out of all the places that we went to, I could honestly say that this is the most well-breaded of the, all of the shrimp. The breading is thin, but still really crunchy. Mm -hmm. And I know the secret ingredient. But what does it rhyme with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you like the bread here compared to the other places? I have to say that my favorite bread is, is still Johnny's. That butter bread will like live in my dreams for all of eternity. I agree. But I will say the shrimp here the is shrimp, a lot more well seasoned. Yeah. If there was anything you could change, what would it be? I'd want more shrimp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can agree with that. Insider tip, they said dip it in the roast beef gravy. This might be a little too much. It's not too much. Yeah. That's bomb. Mm. I need another beer. God, this place is amazing. I would like another Fino. What a trip. Oh my gosh, yes. I think that Po' Boys might now be my favorite sandwich. Nola is truly one of my favorite cities, and the Po' Boy is one of the reasons why. But we're here to make a verdict, so. We have to pick one. Three, two, one. Okay, okay, you know what? It was neck and neck for me. I almost picked that one. Someone's gotta get, pause. Do you see anyone giving in? Do you see yourself giving in? Ah, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I picked Amelise's because Kenny, Joanne, Deborah, the whole crew, just the best people. They haven't changed that recipe for almost a century and for good reason. Yeah. They, they don't need to reinvent anything. They stuck to the classic and they did it so well. They put so much appreciation into that craft. They even make their ketchup in-house. That is true. I also want to say that Damelise's that crunch was probably the best crunch we had. That's why I also almost picked it, but I just wanted more of it. And as much as I love Damelise's, I just felt like Parkways was like the holy trinity of everything you want in the perfect po' boy. It had that super plush bread, you know? It had that super flavorful shrimp, and they gave you a lot of the shrimp, a lot of it. It was they bursting from it. the seams. Yeah. If we're just talking about quantity of shrimp, Parkway did overstuff their po' boy. And that seasoning, though. I'm just gonna go with the fact that Parkway, in that moment when we had Parkway's po' boy and Domelise's po' boy, Parkway gave us more shrimp. Mm -hmm. For that reason alone, I will concede that Parkway is best of the best. I mean, there you have it. Parkway's is the best of the best. I mean, if it's good enough for Beyonce, it's good enough for me. I mean, yeah, if you, if you bring that argument up. 150 <laughs> po' boys from Parkway's. I'm just saying. So that's it guys. Thank you so much for following us on this season of Best of the Best. I'm literally working on making season three right now. So please let us know in the comment section what you'd like to see. And until then, bye bye.